Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, July 13th, 2020 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 emergency, the governor has issued executive orders making temporary changes to the requirements of the Open Meetings Act to allow the board and the public to comply with the most current rules regarding social distancing. Tonight, we do have a board member who's uh, gonna be connecting with us via phone, and some of our central administrative staff is as well so that we could provide as much space as possible for guests to come here in person. This meeting is also being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove YouTube channel, and the recording will also be posted on the District 58's YouTube channel uh, once we receive that from the Village. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there to my right. Uh, members of the public who are viewing remotely may also provide public comment by submitting the public comment Google form. The link to the form is available on the meeting agenda in board docs under agenda item number 10, public comment. This form is open now for comments and will remain open until we reach that portion of the agenda. I've allotted up to 60 minutes tonight for public comment because I expect that this will be a more active meeting tonight. Um, and I ask you to keep those to two minutes each for in-person comments and uh, for those who have submitted cards. I will then read aloud comments submitted remotely in the order in which they were received. In the event we run out of time to read all of the remote comments aloud, please know that we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on the agenda in board docs. I also want to let you know that all board members are receiving them as they come in as well so that we have an opportunity to see them before we go in to vote tonight. Uh, if you would like to refer to them uh, after the meeting, they will be there. Uh, should there be any time remaining after we come back from those online comments, I will make additional time for anyone else who wishes to make a comment here in our audience. We're going to kick off tonight, as we always do, uh, with a slightly different outfit change to do the uh, flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you everybody who's here with us tonight and everybody who's connected watching us on YouTube. We're gonna start, we're gonna dive right in tonight and get right in on our spotlight on our schools and talk about the work that the remote task force worked on just recently, thank you. Dr. Russell. Good evening, everyone. Joining me tonight via phone is Justin Sissel. Uh, before we get going, um, I want to thank all of the students of District 58, all of our staff of District 58, and all of our parents. Um, you know, there's a reason they're calling this the, the novel coronavirus. This is a brand new situation that none of us have ever experienced before. And when you start to talk about our safety and our well being, especially that of our children, um, you can understand why people are so passionate about this topic. I want to thank everyone who's contacted me, staff members, community members, uh, the level of civility as we get through this together. It's one of the things I've always been proud of about Downers Grove since I've been a kid here, is that we can always solve our problems collaboratively and uh, through thoughtful dialogue and uh, through a lot of really good teamwork and a lot of really good research. So I hope uh, by the end of tonight's meeting, we'll all settle on um, an agreeable solution so we can move forward and, and do what's best for our children while making sure that our children and our staff, are, their safety is paramount and their well-being. So with that, um, we'd like to provide you with consideration and updates on our plan for instruction for the fall. So the overview of the presentation tonight is really going to focus in on three areas. First, we're going to talk about the remote learning task force that we assembled that met throughout the month of June and just concluded its work on June 30th. June 30th was two weeks ago, but yet it seems like it was about six months ago with what everything is, is how quickly things are moving. 
We also want to review the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Department of Public Health's most recent and current guidance. Uh, ISB and IDPH put out a uh, joint guidance for us. Uh, it, it's this, many of you have read this online. And this is really our blueprint moving forward uh, based on uh, what was shared in that document. The next thing that we want to talk about is we want to talk about the different options and scenarios that we have in front of us uh, for the fall. And I also want to highlight that as we talk about these different options, I think we all need to recognize that at any given time, we could be in any one of these options depending on this ever-evolving situation. So what I would ask our community, what I'd ask our staff and, and our, our students is to think of this as a continuum and where is the right entry point on the continuum? James, I don't know if uh, we clicked the button there. There you go, perfect, thank you. So um, when we look at what the task force charge was, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin and Justin can go through uh, what we were trying to accomplish as a task force. Thanks, Kevin. So as we began the remote learning task force, the first step was for all of the, the members of the task force to review all of the information that was currently available to us. That certainly included all of the feedback that we had gathered in March from the remote learning surveys that were, that were administered to, to students, to staff, and to families. We were looking at the most current ISB guidance, which at that point was not our most current version of the ISB guidance that came out in late June, but looking at all of the guidance that we had issued throughout remote learning, and also looking at the governor's plan and what impact that had on the moving forward through phases for school districts. We initially broke the task force into four working groups, one each to consider three potential scenarios, remote learning, blended or hybrid learning, and on-site learning. And then we had a fourth group that focused really on the health and safety and well-being protocols, knowing that that work would overlap with each group, but it also allowed for the, the first three groups to be able to really focus in on the instructional side of things, knowing that the health and safety pieces were being covered by a fourth group. We can move to the next slide. One of the biggest challenges for this task force was that we weren't going to be able to answer all of the questions at that point in time. We knew that ISB guidance would be forthcoming. We knew that things would be evolving. And so what, what this group was asked to do was not to solve the problems, but to identify the things that would need to be addressed as we work to build a plan for the fall. So we really tried to stay in the lane of thinking about what would need to be articulated, what would need to be determined as we moved into any one of these scenarios in the fall. And, and the hope was to provide an outcome that would let future working groups really dig in and develop the details as guidance emerged further and we became closer to the opening of school. And so that really was the, the hope and, uh, at the beginning and the ultimate outcome of the task force, acknowledging that we would always have to take the work of the task force and bring it together with the most curtain guidance from ISB, from the Department of Public Health and all of the other agencies that we are beholden to, to really work through and develop those details. So the next slide looks at all of the areas that were considered by these different working groups. And in, in an attempt to keep tonight's presentation somewhat concise, there's a great deal of detail from each working group included on tonight's board agenda. It really is the presentation that each of those groups gave to the full task force at the conclusion of their work. To highlight a few of these, all of the groups talked about the, the critical importance of communication in all directions from to families with staff to students, staff to parents, administration to staff, so that we really would be fully informed and clearly informed and concisely informed about whatever would be happening in the fall. We spent a lot of time talking about instruction and what that would look like in each of these scenarios and what best practices were available and how we could work collaboratively to Im implement those best practices universally and, and equitably across the district. We talked about assessment, both in terms of determining where students are in the fall based on remote learning, and also considering if we were, for example, in a remote learning environment, how to continue to administer authentic assessment to our students in that environment. All of the groups spent a lot of time talking about the social emotional learning and needs of, of all students in all scenarios. That was definitely a critical piece. And that leads right into the supports we need to provide in any scenario for students, staff, and families. We talked a lot about logistics, knowing that we would need to plan for transitions, knowing that instructional safety and instructional on-site on instruction protocols would be a, a, a key component and that we would be developing new expectations in any of these scenarios when we return in the fall. 
We also spend a lot of time, particularly in the health safety and well-being group, looking at the current guidance and talking about PPE and personal protective equipment, all of the protocols for transportation, for what would happen if a staff member or a student was sick, and, and what kinds of cleaning we would need to do, remembering again that this group did not was not asked to answer all of these questions. This group was asked to give us the, 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 the questions and the scenarios and the things, the items for consideration as we build out the final plans going forward. Next slide, please. In every committee and, and, and uh, task force council type work in District 58, we ask for feedback every step of the way. And so at the end of the task force work, we asked all of the members to fill out an exit slip. And some of the common things that came through in that slip were the emphasis on the, the critical importance of student safety, that social emotional need of all students, and communication across the board. There was a recognition that on-site instruction is important and is, and is typically preferred with the acknowledgement that there are safety needs in those scenarios. There was also tremendous um, comment in the open-ended sections about understanding that this is a difficult decision and even task force members having spent a month really dug into all of the feedback and the most current guidance and, and really um, quality conversations were still finding it difficult to make a, a decision or anticipate what direction might be best. And the other piece that was really um, emphasize that I want to also emphasize is that this was a group that was dedicated and committed across the board. Again, this was parents, this was teachers, this was um, administrators, and and you know, no one came in with an agenda. Everyone came in and did the work of reading all the information, having really open quality discussions. We had a lot of a lot of time for that, and I think everyone took away that reality that you know we have a, a wonderful community that was represented in this group that is is willing to roll up its sleeves and figure out as best we can what our next best steps will be. Next slide, please. We did ask that at that moment, as a task force member, what, what are your feelings? What do you think we should do? And again, the, here's where open-ended questions were wrought with, I chose this, but I, I also am thinking about this. It was, it was a difficult decision. And you know, remembering that there are 55 responses, I think what that pie chart tells us is that there wasn't really a clear consensus, to be sure. You know, the difference between 52% and 38% is actually eight people in this, in this model. Um, as we looked at the feedback, Blended, in, uh, blended instruction was not necessarily, we didn't define a specific model, we just talked about it conceptually. And so there were, I think there were different perceptions for some people on what blended could look like in terms of logistics. And there was also a, a, a notice in the exit slip um, comments that a lot of the responses for blended expressed that desire that we would like to be on site, but, but people initially just really couldn't wrap their heads around how our physical space could accommodate the, the safety precautions that need to be put in place. And, and that's, that certainly is a, is a fair perception or that we're going to talk quite a bit about later in this presentation. We can move on to the next slide. So now what I wanna dive into is the State Board of Education's guidance. Um, this came toward the end of June. And whenever you get anything from the State Board of Education, uh, Board of Education, excuse me, this is no knock against them, but often it leads to a lot more questions than answers. So again, this was the document that we've got, and this is the FAQ that the state put out. I wanna highlight they have recently updated this for I think the fourth or fifth time is, is, is late as, or it is a few days ago on July 9th. So it is very much still a complex moving target as we try to identify exactly what the state wants us to do. Because one of the things that I have to emphasize over and over again is that as an educator, my realm is curriculum, assessment, instruction, social emotional learning. My realm is not health um, and, and public health in, in, in safety. And so we very much have to rely on the experts. I, I've had many people contact me saying, you don't need to worry about the state guidance or what the health department's saying. You need to do you know, this or, or open the schools and all that. And, and my response to them is always, yes, we do. We are bound to follow the rules of the State Board of Education, the Illinois Department of Public Health, the DuPage County Health Department, and we must insist on objective criteria. There are so many subjective feelings around this topic that we all have to have a common denominator. And for me, it is this guidance. What is this guidance telling us to do? And can we pull it off in a safe manner? That is my guiding light. So as I look at this guidance, 
Here are some key takeaways. Again, this is all online for people to review. We sent this out to our families uh, as soon as it was made available as well. So everyone in District 58 has had an opportunity to take a look at this. Um, full disclosure though, uh, I, I don't expect all of our families to read through 63 pages of guidance. Uh, you know, that's what we're here for to really dive through it. So in-person blended and or remote instruction is permissible under that. So we've got a lot of different options as a school district. However, it strongly encourages in-person learning for children under the age of 13. So as an elementary district, when you look at our kids, that pretty much covers pre-K through seventh grade. In eighth grade, a lot of kids will turn 14 years old. So when we're looking at this from an administrative lens, we're very much looking at this guidance saying, okay, if we're an elementary district, we should do everything possible to get kids in school. Please note that this doesn't mean that any kid over 13 isn't going to be subject to the same safety regulations or, or procedures as those under 13. But what you will see is high schools may take a different approach to this guidance based off of that sentence that you see there. Also says districts must be prepared to shift to remote instruction. This is not something like the spring where they told us on a Friday at the governor's press conference, schools are closed and you now need to offer remote instruction. What they're telling us is get going on this and start planning because at any moment, one of your schools, the entire district, the county and or the state could be in remote instruction. They're also telling us that we need to require use of appropriate PPE, including face coverings. Uh, that by far has probably been one of the most um, hot topics in Downers Grove. I get a lot of questions about face coverings. Here it is right in the guidance. These are not optional also prohibits more than 50 individuals gathering in one space. Why? Because we're in phase four. That is the rule for phase four. We are allowed to be here tonight, but if you notice, we have to do it significantly different because of the rules. You can see plexiglass shields. You can see no one's around six feet of one another. People are wearing masks, uh, those things. It requires social distancing to be observed six feet as much as possible. Uh, we'll continue to hit that theme, but that is a very very big one as you would see with us tonight. I think one of the things that I got a, a, a lot of feedback from through this process is, is people are still trying to imagine school like it was when we left, right? Where you didn't have the six feet. That very much would not be the case in anything that we're talking about in phase four, which it's tricky for people because it, it's hard to imagine what that could look like. Uh, it requires that schools conduct symptom screenings and temperature checks or requires that individuals self-certify that they are free of symptoms before entering school buildings. Now obviously dealing with minors, their parents would have to self-certify. And there's all sorts of debate on whether or not you're better off having a self-certification system or whether or not you're better off taking temperatures at the door or a hybrid model. And we can discuss all those as we go through. Also requires an increase in school-wide cleaning and disinfection. I want to thank our custodial staff and union. Uh, they have done a great job of really informing us of what they need. And uh, Kevin Bardo and Jeff Newstead are working closely. I, I know I saw Angie uh, here this evening, so I know that's something that's very important to our custodial staff as well. Other key takeaways. I think this, Justin hit this nail right on the head. Guidance is subject to change. Here's a big difference though. If you remember about remote learning, one of the things that we heard a lot of feedback from is the time. It doesn't match a regular day of school. No matter what situation we're in, according to this guidance, you have to have five instructional hours as a minimum. Now, instructional hours doesn't always necessarily mean direct instruction, but kids have to be engaged in learning for five hours. Um, so I want everybody to, to really think about that because it's tricky when you're dealing with kindergartners, when you're dealing with third graders, even when you're dealing with middle schoolers, it, this can be a tricky concept. So what does that look like? Um, busing. A maximum of 50 students can be placed on a bus. Face coverings would be uh, required. So if you picture a bus, most of our routes don't go over 50 students anyway, but it's two by two in a seat, very similar to almost like an airport, or excuse me, an airplane environment that you would see where you really can't observe that social distance, but everybody still has to wear the uh, face coverings. Modifications to grading should be considered. However, one of the things that is abundantly clear is that districts should return to their grading practices. But we need to keep into account 
this unique environment that we're in. It was another um, big piece of feedback we got across the state was grading and that we couldn't grade anything during remote learning and, and several uh, educators felt like kids may have checked out or, or didn't do anything, especially at the uh, older grades. Here's a big one, and, I, and this is something I'm going to advocate for later in the presentation. Five instructional days may be used for planning purposes, collaboration, and or professional development for staff. Wherever we land as a school district, we need these planning days. It's something I'm going to advocate for. We need to do trial runs. We need to make sure that we give our teachers enough time to set up the room. We need to make sure that we have the time to speak to our instructional assistants and really make sure that when our kiddos come back, we're ready to go. I am not a big proponent of taking away instructional days. However, this is one It is so unique this year. Um, no matter what option we're in and our teachers have to prepare for multiple options, we're going to need extra time in order to accomplish that outside of our um, regular instruction day. So what can that look like? We're going to continue to dialogue about that, but uh, primarily what that would look like is using some of those days at the beginning of the school year. Um, so kids might start a few days later than they normally would have, but our staff would still be here. Some other key takeaways. And this breaks my heart because there's nothing better as a parent to see your kid's teacher. I, I think there's such a comfort level when you can see that. Um, so we're going to have to get very creatively. But back to school events need to be held virtually. So a lot of those back to school events that we're used to doing can't happen under this guidance. We've hit this pretty hard. Health and safety protocols must be reviewed and followed. Um, another big thing that this document talks about is equity and placing a high priority on our students with special needs. This is so very important. Um, whenever you have remote learning, equity kind of, you know, comes very big and you really have to pay attention to that. Um, so in the spring, we saw a lot of our students with special needs not be able to get the services that they were used to when they were in in-person instruction. So that's a very big thing uh, that this document talks about. We also need to account for children's entire days and weeks outside of the home when developing these plans. So the way I interpret that is whatever we decide as a school district, if we're not going to have kids come in on certain days, we need to really think about where are our students going to go? Not just some of them, but all of them as a whole. And so these are those reflective questions that we need to think about. Is it better to have kiddos in school in a less than normal situation? Or is it better to do a blended model, but we have to really take into account what it looks like when those students are at home and away from school. So I want to take a brief moment to thank our colleagues from the DuPage County Health Department. Uh, Karen Aiello runs the DuPage County Health Department, and I wish she was listening right now, because she will call a superintendent back within an hour of any question. If we have a positive case, if I need help with guidance, she is so responsive and so is her staff. So I want the board and community to know that when it comes to safety, we've got a great partner with the DuPage County Health Department. Um, we're receiving guidance from them. So for example, today I had a superintendent call with all the superintendents in DuPage County. Karen Ayala leads off that meeting along with her colleagues from the Health Department, which I think is very reassuring for somebody in my position that I can hear it straight from uh, the expert. I will tell you, the DuPage County Health Department has a very conservative approach. And, and I, I want to emphasize that because I know there's a lot of concerns about safety. I am not here to tell you that we can set up a risk-free environment. Whenever we go outside with this pandemic, we're putting ourselves at risk. So my position as a superintendent is who do I turn to to get that information? And the local health department is our guiding light. They're taking their information from the IDPH and the CDC. So they take a very conservative approach. And one of the things that our health department has stressed over and over again is six feet is one of the most important things that you can maintain. They recognize how difficult that is with young children, but that should always be the goal when you're talking about setting up a school. They're also very big on masks. Uh, they must be worn inside at all times, um, even if students are more than six feet apart. Um, that is a challenge in an elementary setting, though. I think we all recognize that. Anyone who has young kids, th that is certainly a challenge. 
other considerations that we still look at, even though we're not under their jurisdiction, although technically I guess you could say we all are under the CDC jurisdiction, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics is something that we looked at extremely closely as well to see the consistency in that guiding document with what we're also seeing from the uh, Illinois Department of Public Health. I will tell you if I were to put it on a continuum, I would put the American Academy of Pediatrics kind of over here with maybe a little more liberal stance about opening schools where you would have our county health department over here with a much more conservative approach about opening uh, schools. But nevertheless, it's a good thing to review all of that guidance. One, uh, to go back to the slide, but this last point I have to emphasize because I've gotten um, a, a lot of feedback um, from members of our community about these are just guidelines. You do not have to follow these guidelines. Where, where's the governor's authority in, in, in all of this? And, and please know I'm not trying to be uh, flippant here, but what I am suggesting is we do not have the luxury of ignoring guidelines as a school district. We put faith in these guidelines, and also um, we could potentially be jeopardizing someone's safety if we didn't listen to the experts. So these guidelines, to me, are non-negotiable, and also our school district would be subject to a ton of unforeseen liability if we did not follow guidelines. Um, so it is very important, first and foremost, for the safety of everyone, but second of all, it diminishes our risks when we're following guidelines. Okay, um, Justin is going to take us through uh, some district leadership team uh, review. On Wednesday, July 8th, the district leadership team did meet to review um, an earlier version of a presentation similar to this and hear the feedback from the remote learning task force and, and look at those options. And this really was a meeting, you know, the district leadership team includes representation from all of our associations, from our parent groups, from our administration groups, and from our school board. And so it was sort of a first look at that feedback and, and, and to give us a chance to work with some small group um, conversations with the district leadership team and hear some of their ideas and thoughts as we begin began to prepare this presentation for the board and community this evening. We can go to the next slide. So as a administration, I get a lot of questions about how are you prioritizing what needs to come first? And I wish it was that simple. There are several things that need to come right to the top. So the list that you're going to see is not listed in order of importance because I believe all of these things are critical. So please don't interpret one being at the top and in the bottom. These are all important to me um, as a superintendent and I know they're important to our staff. Number one, student and staff safety and well-being. Um, I think it's important that we also discuss well-being of our staff and we also discuss well-being of our students. We are social creatures. And so when we're not connected, especially our students, that can cause a lot of health issues. So I often get questioned, well, you know, can you please define safety? And safety, of course, first and foremost, is physical, but there's also emotional well-being and social well-being that is such an integral part of what we do as an educational institution. We, of course, are looking at instructional needs. Another huge component to our work is equity. I talked earlier about the equity of special needs students needing access. We also have families that do not have the same resources that other families do. So as we develop plans, you know, it may be okay for one family to have this situation, but that may not work out for another family because of childcare, because of money, because of internet accessibility, you name it. So equity is a huge driving factor in any recommendation that I will make moving forward because it's something that we have to account for for all 5,000 plus students in our school district. Um, students with special needs is obviously a high priority. Um, all of our students have unique needs, but there are many of our students, whether they have a 504 plan or an IEP, that we really think have to think long and hard about how we can deliver that um, in an on-site model, a blended model, or remote. Uh, it's very important that our students with special needs get the services that they are entitled to based on their disability. I've already spoken to adherence to guidelines. Uh, I'm a rule follower by nature, and so this is obviously uh, very important to all of us. I think we also have to be aware of what other local districts are doing, right? Um, while we always want to be a leader here in District 58, we also want to make sure that what we're doing is closely aligned to what our partner school districts are doing. 
So I've gotten a lot of questions um, you know, around that, and one of the things I can assure the board is a couple of things. Number one, every elementary district superintendent that I'm in contact with, including the 99 feeder schools, is trying to do everything they can to get as much on-site instruction as possible as long as they can do it safely. The second thing I can assure you is that every school district in Illinois is unique and our plans will not match it because they have not been mandated. So we've been left by the state to develop 862 different plans, which is a concern uh, when you start to think about the fact that not all of our staff live in District 58. So that's going to have an impact that we need to really uh, talk about. Um, nevertheless, though, we have to be aware of other uh, district plans. And, I, and I'm happy to answer questions about that as we have a uh, further conversation. I've mentioned this a few times, but we have to consider the impact that our decisions have on district families and our staff, right? Um, it, it's about both, and how do we set up an environment where everyone can be uh, successful, but no matter what we pick, it is gonna have a dis or an impact on those families and our staff. Um, and, and the landscape has changed a bit since the spring. So the spring, most people were closed down. They were able to be home. Here now, going into late summer, that is typically not the case anymore as, as a lot of employers are requiring their employees to head back to work, right? Case in point, here we are, where this is the first time we've been back in this room since the pandemic started. We also have to recognize our role in the community as more than just a school. We are the hub of our community. Our community turns to us to be the center of all activity and we have that social responsibility to our community members to not only provide a top-notch education, but to also look out to the welfare of our families, our students, and our staff. So we have a significant role to play. Obviously, everyone in this room knows that, but it's worth noting. So Justin's going to come back here now and talk about options. So as Kevin mentioned earlier, we really do have a continuum of instructional possibilities for the fall. And on the bookends of that continuum would be fully remote, where all instruction was received off-site, and fully on-site, which we're kind of defining at this point as sort of that return to school as we knew it. And I think we can acknowledge that that, that fully on-site, that phase five moment, is, is a long way from, from our current vision right now. Also, hearing Kevin talk through the guidance and really how it emphasizes a return to on-site instruction where it is possible, given the safety parameters and guidance, we're really going to focus in going forward with this presentation on blended learning and specifically on what we're now calling modified on-site, which is a recognition of on-site instruction that really doesn't look like what we would recall on-site instruction having looked like this past school year. We also want to acknowledge again, and we've said this before tonight and we'll say it again, we could be obligated to shift from one scenario to another at virtually any time. And yet knowing that, we're trying to plan with at least a first trimester left, trying to think about that first 12 weeks of instruction as the period of time we would be building a plan that we would hope to be able to continue to implement for at least that long. We can move to the next slide. As we start to talk about scenarios that contain on-site instruction, one of the first things we have to do is really ask ourselves to reimagine what on-site instruction is going to look like. Kevin mentioned this earlier. It's, it's very difficult to imagine the classrooms that we are familiar with being able to comply with all of the safety and, and social distancing requirements that exist. And so we have to start to shift our thinking into physical configurations that would mean we would be accomplishing that six foot distancing which means likely students are in individual desks that are probably in rows it means that the things that we have in so many of our classrooms with, with groupings and students moving through centers and working at tables or flexible seating all of those kinds of things would not be a part of on-site instruction right now either blended or modified on-site the guidance also speaks strongly to keeping students in cohort groups, which is to say that we would minimize the movement of students throughout the building as much as possible, but also we would minimize the, the different groupings of students throughout a school day so that we really are working with a, a group of students that stays pretty consistent in an environment for the bulk of a school day. We also have to think about teacher proximity. You know, we, we have moved away from the teacher standing in the front of the room delivering instruction to a room full of students in desks and rows in many cases. And yet that is a scenario that would be physically 
very likely much of the time. I don't, I don't think it's realistic to say that a teacher would never be within six feet of a student. That's not it. But, but thinking about the majority of time, you know, as opposed to those moments in passing or for quick individual feedback, we really would be talking about teachers at a, at a, different, at a different physical proximity to students than we're used to. And then we have to think about the schedules, and, and this one can become quickly overwhelming. You know, Kevin talked about the, the concerns of having elementary school and even middle school students in masks for a significant length of time. The one place we are permitted to allow students to remove masks is if we can be outside in a, a space of six feet or greater between students. And so scheduling things that would, that would be anywhere from outdoor instruction on nice days to at least having breaks. Thinking about recesses and the way we would have to reimagine those things. Thinking about a middle school class schedule that really didn't include student passing periods necessarily, but instead handled movement of classes or shifting of instruction in different ways. There's a lot of pieces here that would be different than the on-site instruction that we have known. And I think even considering all of that, there is traction behind the idea that on-site instruction is still a stronger instructional option because the truth is our teachers are phenomenal and we can't ask them to do things that go beyond guidance but but i am confident and i know that our administrative team is confident that even with these restrictions in place we can create powerful instructional experiences for our children can we move to the next slide please Oop, I so I went, uh, went too far Thank you. So as we talk about blended learning, um, to define this a little further, obviously the concept here is that students are on site to receive instruction for a portion of their day or week, and then they are receiving a portion of that instruction remotely. And so um, we're going to start to see this number of 14 to 19. And so let me pause for a minute and talk about that. We've done some initial measuring of our classroom spaces. We've literally laid out desks with six foot um, markings to see how many students can we safely fit into a room with that six foot uh, requirement. And we also have to recognize that across our school district, the square footage in classrooms can vary by up to 200 square feet in, in one direction or the other based on when a building was built or when the addition was put on or what the purpose for instruction was when that classroom was built. It's part of the unique character of all of our buildings. And so we're, we're using that range of 14 to 19, identifying that for some rooms it may be closer to 14 and 15, but for, for many rooms it can be closer to 18 and 19 uh, um, to achieve, to still maintain social distance space and space for in a teacher's instructional area to be that removed from from six feet removed from the student desks the other thing when we talk about a blended concept is we think about how we would group students and our initial thinking were we to go down this road would be alphabetical simply because that would keep families intact in terms of having all children in a family attending uh, at, at the same uh, time or the same period of time within the blended model Kevin mentioned earlier the equity considerations and the guidance speaks to the, you know, one of the things we would need to think about in a blended model would be the possibility for bringing our students who are in special programs or have identified special or special needs to the on-site instruction components perhaps more frequently than all students. Another thing we really have to keep in mind with a hybrid or blended model is that the, the, the portion of a blended model that is remote which is, let me say it again, the portion of a blended model that's remote, which is the opposite of on-site. So if group A is on-site on Monday and group B is not on-site on Monday, group B's Monday experience wouldn't be able to look like what remote learning looked like for us in April and May. Because one teacher cannot be concurrently responsible in those same moments for delivering on-site instruction to the 14 or 15 students in front of them, as well as hosting Zoom meetings and responding to seesaw questions and delivering feedback and all of those things to the other students because those two things aren't compatible in the same physical moment. And so while there could be a remote component in a blended model, we have to recognize that the, the, the opposite of on-site moments would not look like the remote learning scenario that we experienced in the spring. In terms of format, there are a number of options, and each one of these is being employed by some district in the state at some point. There are, there's a half-day option where you could have a group attend for the morning and a group attend for the afternoon. There's the option of splitting a week where you would have a group that could come on certain days of the week and a group that could come on other days of the week. Many of these plans that districts, and this is an option that is popular in many high school districts, many of these the districts then also include sort of a full remote day to give some space where there are where the building is not fully occupied. There are other districts who look at a week on or a week off model. So there, you know, if we if we as we 
begin to consider components of blended learning, certainly there are numbers, there are a number of logistical options that we could consider. We'll move to the next slide. Modified on-site learning then is the concept where we would have all of our students on site five days a week, which means that all of their instruction or the vast, vast majority would take place on site. It would require utilizing virtually all space in every building to accomplish that. Um, which would mean that things would happen like elementary specials likely taking place in classrooms, which again minimizes the movement of students and, and minimizes the, the space and helps us to accomplish some of the space needs that would be there. We would want to use outdoor space as much as possible, certainly in these first couple of months of school. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not, it, it wouldn't necessarily be impossible to have an entire morning outside in certain ways with, with instructional considerations. We've talked about guidance, guidelines being followed. That, that would have to be, again, any on site scenario, whether it's modified on site or blended, must contain that. We've talked about that cohorting of students where we would minimize movement, the class sizes. Again, a lot of this similar to the on site component of the blended model. If we, as we move to a modified on site consideration, one of the things that we would want to leave room for as we build out the details of the plan is that the length of the day might be slightly modified as we work to finalize that sketch. Again, we, we would want to accomplish that five clock hours as, because we, that is a, that's a requirement, but we also need to think about just the physical structure of the scheduling of the day may necessitate a slight shift to the, the, in, the on-site hours that we have become accustomed to. Another thing that is something we want to consider as we work toward developing a, a full modified on-site learning plan is the idea that our, our kindergarten, right now obviously we have an OKEEP program that we value and we have advocated for and they're, they're, it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredibly strong program. And yet we also know that the core instruction of the kindergarten program is currently designed to be delivered in a half day. And so there is the possibility that we could consider moving kindergarten to a half day program and suspending OKEEP for a period of time as we worked to build stamina for our youngest learners in this modified on-site model. Can we move to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. So we have done some initial counting and, and looking closely at each building map and each, each building's current enrollment. And our initial work tells us that each building can accommodate classes with, those, with the sizes that will allow for that six foot distancing if a few things happen. You know, we've talked about using all instructional spaces. So in a situation where you might have currently two classes of 20 second graders in a building, it might be that the entire second grade then would move into the library or the gym, and that would be a space that would be utilized for those 40 second graders because we would have the space to keep the six foot distance, and then the two teachers would remain with those two classes. And so it could become, there, and there are models we have across the district where it could become two unique spaces within a larger space. It could become more of a, a team teaching or co-teaching model among those two teachers, but there are a number of possibilities that could exist there. It would likely mean that certified staff would be finding themselves teaching in some different roles to accommodate some of those grade level sections. Because in the places where you cannot move a group of 40 second graders, let's say you have a group of 48 third graders. So even that, you know, 48 plus two teachers, we're right on that line of 50 and that's a bigger space. So those 48 third graders may now become, rather than two sections of 24, they may become three sections of 16. And that's where we would need to work with our certified staff to find a way to bring some additional certified teachers on to support those grade level teams and that grade level instruction. We know that middle school schedules would absolutely be complex, especially if we're trying to think about students moving less and teachers moving between classrooms for to deliver instruction. There, there is absolutely work to be done to develop a middle school schedule. From a space perspective, it is possible. The scheduling will, will it, there, there are many details that we still would want to be working through. One benefit is that our specialized programs are already at this 14 to 19 range, and so they would not realize um, section adjustments. In fact, in, in some cases, because of idea requirements, they're actually a little lower than that. One acknowledgement also is that there are a couple of buildings where there simply isn't the physical space, even with every creative piece of movement possible. And so the modified on-site learning plan would likely require us to move some students from Highland and Leicester schools to accommodate and accomplish the distancing we would need. And so two ideas that are on the table right now 
are the consideration of moving kindergarten sections to element to sort of building elementary partner schools. There would be space at Pierce Downer and Bel Air to accommodate those sections based upon our initial projections. Another possibility is that sixth grade sections could move to O'Neill, where there would be space to accommodate those sixth grade sections. These, some of these are examples of, again, the, the less desirable pieces of a modified on-site learning plan. But again, these are, these are things that we would work to put in place and, and work to, to, you know, to minimize impact while we're still trying to find a path toward maximizing on-site instruction. Can we move to the next slide, please? At the bottom of these previous slides, you've seen the phrase, further planning would need to take place with our staff. And, and this is really the linchpin of what we're talking about tonight. We've heard from staff members that there is some hesitation and frankly some skepticism regarding whether this is actually feasible with maintaining safety. And, and that, of, of course there is. That, that's a very logical response because we haven't had a chance to work with our staff yet on some of the details around these plans. The, the, the Remote Learning Task Force finished its work on June 30th ISBE's guidance came out a few days before that, and today is July 13th. And so this is exactly why we need to take the next steps that we want to take. It is that collaborative work with our administrators and our teachers that will help us to inform these final plans and work out all of the final details that, that would need to be there. As a central office administrative team, we can absolutely take a look at maps and numbers and concepts and, and begin to put some things together, but it would be disingenuous to think that we have the same inner working knowledge of each classroom and each building that a principal and a teacher does. And so that is why our next steps are so critically important. And again, we, we, we need to be prepared to shift as we have new and or updated information, which could mean that we, we do find something that is truly insurmountable as we begin to develop a plan like this. And then we do have to, we have to amend our thinking and we have to pivot a bit to make sure that any scenario we put in place absolutely m minimizes risk and, and adheres to all of the guidance so very strictly. The last step then that we would, well, not the last step, but a, a, another step that we would want to take would be to reconvene that remote learning task force, which consisted of parents and teachers and administrators, because again, the, the, their work gives us the, the guardrails to follow as we develop these plans. And so, so then who better to take a look at the details of that plan and say, yes, you did answer these questions, or no, there are a few areas that haven't been addressed so that we can continue to refine all of that work. We can move to the next slide. Okay, so now we're going to get to the administrative recommendation, which, which I think is always on everyone's you know, mind. We, we spent a lot of time talking with our staff and, and family since last Friday, and it's my intent here to really give you the why behind the recommendation. Um, first thing I want to recognize to everyone, this is an imperfect situation. No matter what we decide as a board, as a superintendent, with our staff, as a community, we all have to know that it's going to impact people differently. And because of that, nothing will be universally accepted. So what options can we provide our families that can maybe help them uh, through this process? I think that's something that's very important to us as we go through. Um, when I looked at this in, in talking with our team, when considering all the factors, the prioritization or making in-person instruction a priority is the best option that most closely aligns with the guidance at this time. And I want to read from you straight from the guidance. The guidance says, schools and districts are encouraged to provide completely in-person instruction for all students in phase four, provided that the school is able to comply with capacity limits and implement social distancing measures. So this is not something that, again, willy-nilly, I decided, you know, with the team, hey, we should just do this. What I am trying to do as the superintendent is to implement the guidance as provided by the State Board of Education in Phase 4. I'm also here to tell you, as Justin pointed out, one of the things I don't think any of us have any interest in doing is putting a round peg into a square hole and just hoping that it will fit, right? So it is going to take a lot of work with our staff to make sure that what looks good on paper or the blueprint can actually work 
when it comes you know, down to it. So one of the most common questions I get is, is this a done deal, what, what I'm about to ask everyone? And my answer is nothing is ever a done deal in a school district until we're 100% confident that it can work. And even if we are, know that there's still going to be hiccups in any kind of plan uh, that we do. But why am I prioritizing in-person instruction? Go back to the guidance. Most of our kids are under 13. If we can meet the social distancing requirements, I'm going to make a strong argument that we were bound to do that by the guidance that's in front of us. And I also want to go to our mission statement of District 58. These are not just things that we put on a wall. It's something that we really try and live out on a day-to-day -day basis. The mission of District 58 in partnership with parents and community is to challenge and engage each child by providing quality educational programs and support services in safe, nurturing, and child-centered environments in order to prepare all students to be lifelong learners and contributing members of a global society. I'm really highlighting those words, quality educational programs, support services, safe, child-centered environments. This is no knock against remote learning. I am extremely proud of the work that we did with remote learning as a school district. I think we led. I am so very proud of our teachers, our support staff, our custodians for everything they did to make that happen. But even from a parent lens, in-person instruction to me is always far superior to remote instruction, especially when you're dealing with young children. And, and as I keep thinking of this, when I'm thinking of our new preschoolers or our new kindergartners or our newer, our newer first graders, I can't imagine a start to the school year where they don't have as much contact with their teacher as possible. And so that's in the forefront of my planning. But certainly, we need to really work with our staff to make sure that this can work before we allow the students back to school. So I would like to recommend that we pursue the feasibility of having students and staff come back to school under a modified instructional plan. What would that look like? What does this mean? Again, it would mean that all students and staff return for five days a week. It would mean that we have to adhere to the safety guidance. It would also mean that class sizes are made as small as possible. All staff and spaces are utilized to the fullest potential. And again, in non-negotiables, we have to sit down with our staff um, to make sure that that can work. Uh, we will concurrently build and prepare for fully remote learning and a blended option so that we can be prepared for any possible occurrence. I think that's also uh, very important. Uh, additional considerations. Students and staff may not be able to return because of underlying medical conditions. We are bound to accommodate both of those situations. If a staff, has a certified, staff member has a certified health condition, of course we have to accommodate that. Same thing with a student. Now with that student accommodation, that's different than someone saying, my child doesn't have an underlying condition, I'm not sending them back to school. Those are two different situations. I, I, I just want to be clear on that, and that brings me to my next point. Families who may choose not to return but wish to remain enrolled in District 58, so that, that's a different group. One of the options that we are pursuing is still giving those families a remote option. If this is a bridge too far, despite the guidance, if this is a bridge too far for them, one of the things we're looking at is what we did in summer school with our Acellus online learning where staff members work with students checking in with them. However, it is that self-paced online program so our kiddos don't fall behind and families who aren't comfortable sending their uh, children back to school would at least have a strong base to uh, go off of. Again, I want to differentiate between a medically fragile student, that's a completely different situation with homebound tutoring and things that by law we would adhere to. Um, not sending your child to school would be an option for some families and we would help them with that. Um, we also need to anticipate, like many school districts are, that some families may just fully withdraw from District 58. I think we're seeing that throughout uh, Illinois and, and really throughout the country, especially in those um, really hot states right now in terms of outbreak. Um, students who are eligible for IEP in 504, uh, those students will continue to be supported through the procedures and practices to which they are entitled to in each specific situation or scenario. So what are our next steps um, as I see them? And then of, of course the board will have a conversation to really determine that. But I will seek board approval later to move forward with this guidance. Um, working groups 
would be formed to plan for all scenarios. Uh, this would include arrival, dismissal, transitions, lunch, et cetera, you name it. Justin shared that list at the beginning where there are literally hundreds of things. And this is where Justin was very frank with the, with the board and community about if there is something that's insurmountable, we would have to come back to the board and share that with them. But again, if we're adhering to the guidance, that's why I'm recommending we go there first. Working groups would also be formed to plan for these other situations as we've talked about. Our next steps. We have to survey staff and families on components of the plan if approved by the board, which will assist us in finalizing all details. One of the biggest questions that I've gotten is why haven't you surveyed people yet? And I think that is a very fair question. It's a chicken or an egg question though. Um, you know, as I read the guidance, um, one of the things that encourages you to do is once you get pointed in the right direction, then you form your groups and then you really start to look at that. I also want to remind everyone, you know, we had June 30th, that's when the remote learning task force ended. This came out at the end of June. They're still updating the guidance document. So surveying our community and our teachers before this stuff really gets finalized is sometimes an exercise in futility because it can change. And so I think we need to be very careful that we don't survey people yet on things that we don't even know what they're going to look like in the end. Now that we feel a little bit more comfortable, now it is time to survey our staff. We need to know which staff members may have those medical conditions that we talked about. We need to know what staff think about this recommendation. We need to know what families think about this recommendation. We've got to ask our families who may be having kindergarten students in, if I'm going to come back and, and talk about kindergarten maybe looking a little bit differently, we need to know how those families feel about that. We need to address um, temperature in our school. We need to talk about whether or not we think it's a good idea to have heat advisory days if, if kids are uncomfortable in school. So there's all sorts of different things that we need to come back after we survey our community and share that information with the board. So again, I'm going back to that, is this a done deal? I'm going to argue, no, nothing's ever a done deal because data informs our decisions as we continue to move forward, but we need to start where the guidance is telling us, in, in my view. Um, we will then have to request a special board meeting take place. Um, I have early August, but, but what we're asking for as an administration is between the July meeting and the August meeting, we are going to ask the board to come back for a special meeting. In that special meeting, we would have those conversations about those things that we need to be approved after we are wor done working with our working groups. And what I mean by that is, can school start at the same time? Uh, do we need to do something differently with transportation? How many of these planning days should we have? And the list kind of goes on and on. Um, you know, should we move a grade level from one school to another? And again, I want to talk about that specifically because I don't want anyone misinterpreting what we said tonight. These are possibilities that we're examining. Of course, we will have further conversation about that. So I, again, I want to emphasize that. So then, if everything looks online at that in-between meeting, when we get back to our August meeting, after our principals are fully returned, we can share, here is the plan for Hillcrest, here is the plan for Bel Air, here is the plan for El Sierra, and then our principals can begin communicating that out to their families. But it is July 13th. And we do have to start um, making sure that we take into consideration our families, child care options, and things like that. So we, we have to start getting going in that right direction, despite the state really putting us behind the eight ball here, we still have to start moving uh, in that. So again, that final plan would be shared at the regular August meeting. And if we had to pivot, obviously that would be shared at that point. So, to close this presentation, I shared this with the district leadership team, and I think it's a very good analogy. If you've ever seen the movie Apollo 13, where the astronauts are struggling to come back, and they're almost out of CO2, and they have all these people in the room, and they have the round peg into the square hole, and they said, the only way we can get those astronauts back is if we figure out, with only the stuff on this table, how to put this round peg in the square hole. I think that's very much where every district is at in Illinois. I'm very comfortable that we are with District 58 because I think we've got the talent. I think we've got the minds to do this uh, and, and really start working on this and uh, move forward. So with that, um, 
I want to turn it back over to the uh, board president. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. And I know Justin and the rest of the administrative staff can also uh, help answer questions. Well, thank you uh, so much for taking the time to walk us through all that. I'm sure everybody's got a lot of questions or concerns that they want to bring up at this point. We do have uh, Greg, uh, Member Harris there on, on the phone. So maybe I'll try to, to start with him. Uh, Greg, can you hear us OK? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't have any questions at this time, but thank you. OK. Well, then I guess I'll, I'll open the floor. And um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to kind of pass the baton to you guys and, and, and get, get the conversation started. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start. I, I, I guess uh, Kevin and Justin, I just want to um, thank you. Uh, you know, I applaud the, the process and level of consideration um, that's kind of gone into getting to this point, knowing that it's a, a moving target. Um, I, I think it's clear that we're not just waving our hands in there and saying, make it work no matter what. So I just want to say thank you for getting to this point. Thank you. Um, I actually have a couple questions. That's fine. Um, thank you to Justin and you, Kevin, for um, and your whole ASC team. Um, I've called you at very random times uh, with questions. So I know that you guys are not just throwing something up at the board. I know you've worked really hard on this. Um, that said, um, thank you for clarifying. I, I, I had a lot of phone calls from people this weekend, so I'm, I tried to condense down the questions that sure. I got to, um, to bring to the table. Um, you answered the question about why you haven't surveyed the community. That was something um, that I got a lot of, so thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, it makes sense to me. I'd rather you have some plans in place to um, present before uh, asking them and then not being able to deliver on something that the community is asking for. Um, why do you recommend uh, modified on-site versus hybrid? Yeah. So first and foremost, and, and I won't read the guidance again, but as I interpret this guidance, um, I'm interpreting it as long as it's safe to do so. And again, safety according to the guidance. It is telling us that we need to prioritize in-person instruction. And so I'm, 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 my recommendation is based straight off of the guidance, that, that clear objective criteria. That is why I started there and didn't start at a blended model. If the guidance would have said, start at a blended model and work toward on site, I certainly would have done that. But I also want to be clear, we also took into consideration the work of the Remote Learning Task Force, albeit it was a non-binding question. The way I interpret that, and, and again, that's open to interpretation, is we had a, a large people say they want to blend it, and a, and a large amount of people say they want it on site. I'm right in between there because I don't think you can make fully on site work. You can't in, in stage four. So that was also a consideration a, as we went in there. Um, but, but again, reading straight from page nine of the phase four overview, that's where I'm coming from. Okay. Um one of the um, things that you had listed on one of the slides was how does the um, you might have to talk about the length of the day yeah I, I forget where that is um, is that something through the working groups you're you're just throwing that out there in case you need to modify like, yeah so length of the day is, is a very important thing um, for a variety of factors um, and I don't mean to bore people with things that we have teachers need to get ready in the morning they have to get their rooms prepared Typically, we have students arrive at school while teachers are doing that, and we have supervisors outside, right? But we can't have kids line up in the same manner that they've always lined up. So we may have to delay the start of the day so our teachers still have their contractual rights followed, and then we can allow the students to come in. We're not talking about a significant delay, but then they could go right back into the classroom where we would still give our teachers adequate time to prepare uh, according to our contract and then allow the students to come in. So that's one example. Another example of this modified on site, one of the things that our teachers have to be able to do is have adequate plan time, right? Not only contractually, but it's the right thing to always make sure that we give our teachers, especially in this situation, all the time they, they really need to be successful. And so typically our classroom teachers are going to get their plan time when you have special teachers going in and out of the classrooms. 
Well, depending on how this works at each building, we might, we might not be able to fit all of that adequate plan time. And so by shortening the day, we could get some of that at the end of the day. So that's just one example. So we need to sit down first and foremost with all of our specialist teachers. We need to sit down with our classroom teachers and, and the, really the, the association leadership to make sure that we can fit in plan time. And so one of the ways we may have to do that is by adjusting the school day. I, I wanna be careful we don't adjust that school day too much though, because now you're in a half day situation which being in an elementary district or districts my entire career, half days are not very convenient for families and, and so I think we really have to be uh, cognizant of that because people just can't leave work at, at 12 o'clock every day uh, they are obviously on a different um, schedule okay and then another thing that you brought up um, which I fielded a lot of a, a lot of calls about was um, the temperature the, the temperature of the day and masks yeah so Six months ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you the first thing about these masks, and, and I know still about this much compared to uh, the scientists in, in, in all of that. I, I will tell you that we've spent significant time talking with our county health department, and the good news from an oxygen perspective is that you can have a mask on all day and it's not gonna diminish your, your oxygen intake unless you have some type of a, an underlying condition. I can tell you as the father of seven children, having to get kids to wear a mask for long periods of time, even adults, can be extremely challenging. Just wearing a hat when it's 95 degrees out, people take that off, they're sweating, right? You're, you're uncomfortable, so to have that on your face. So one of the things um, that we spent a lot of time talking about on the superintendent call today, and we don't have this problem, is air conditioning and whether or not those should be turned on in schools, but we also talked about uh, the heat in the need to get our students outside as much as possible. Uh, get our teachers outside. Now that also poses challenges, right? Now you're dealing with sunburn, September's bee season, you know, so um, it is like whack-a-mole, but um, one of the things that is a non-negotiable in a blended option, in an on-site option, is our kiddos have to get outside. So Todd Drayfall and Kevin Bardo um, have been working extremely hard to secure things like tents for outside. Now, um, they're limited, right? But, but even providing some of those spaces outside so we could have shade for our children is something very important because once they can get outside, then you can have that mask uh, come off. We are also continuing conversations with the county health department about once kids are six feet inside, is there any kind of leeway there? Um, we still have gotten a no on that one, but know that we're gonna keep asking about that and, and continue to look for ways for students to um, be able to take off their mask during the school day. But right now, outside, is hands down the best option because of the heat. Another thing that I intend to survey our families and our staff on is the ability perhaps, and this would have to be a, a, a board approved thing, is can we look at a potential for heat advisory days? And, and what is the research out there telling us in terms of when is it too hot to be inside? So uh, Todd and I, again, have been working and looking at various school districts around the country and how they handle that. Um, there are some districts here in Illinois that also have policies, like Zurich was one that we were looking at, Champaign, I believe was another one that we were looking at. And so we are gonna survey what would be the interest um, about that in particular in, on a day one-off situation could we be in a remote environment for that particular day because it's so hot in the uh, the, the buildings um, I do want to also address the air conditioning if that's okay because I've been getting a ton of questions about we need air in our schools I, I've said this since I've been the superintendent on day one I said it when I was a teacher at O'Neill I agree we all want air conditioning in our, in our schools but that is a conversation we have to have with our facility task force, and we were having that. But with the onset of COVID-19 and the crashing of the economy, that work has been put on hold, but that work has not been forgotten. We are ready to pick up that when the appropriate time and once our economy uh, comes back. Interestingly enough, one of the things that was stressed to us as leaders today was that the best thing you can do is to open up your windows, which I think our teachers would agree in our support staff, that's not gonna be a problem in District 58, um, to open our windows and get that fresh air circulating in. It's that stale air where you're not pulling out the intake. So in those situations too, they talked about if you have an air conditioner that is not pulling in 
outside air, you should run that air conditioner with the windows open, something our fathers yelled at us our entire lives and our mothers for doing. Uh, but that's the only way that they're saying that's uh, permissible now. So Kevin Pardo is working extremely hard to make sure that we get all those questions about um, air conditioning, fan usage, all of those things, and then looking at the heat. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you as the superintendent that this is not a legitimate concern with kids having to wear masks all day. I think it is under normal temperatures, let alone, uh, this is something every school district in Illinois is working on. And outside breaks, again, are gonna be non-negotiable on that. We, ha we have to get kids outside. Okay, and then um, just to make sure, I I'm trying to find the slide. Um, the working groups will be formed to, to plan for all the scenarios, right? So yes. this, is, this could change literally in one day, like mm -hmm. something could happen in the state, the governor, or whatever. So, so even though you're forming a working group to, to flush out, uh, potentially flush out a modified on-site, at the same time, you're still working on all those other groups for the other blended or um, remote. Yes, that is, that is So that you can be prepared per the, per the state guidelines. They said you have to have a remote plan too. Yeah, that is 100% one, accurate. Um, we are working on all these things simultaneously because we have to be, be prepared to pivot at any point. What we don't want to be in is, is a situation where August 20th rolls around and Governor Pritzker says, hey, you're all remote or something like that. And then we go, oh, we need to plan for that. Uh, we need to. Now, one of the things about the remote option, though, that we're still awaiting guidance on is if you read through this guidance, the state is supposed to give further details on what remote can look like. So we have the general framework. It's got to be five hours. So we're going to start with that. But that's, again, another example of how this could pivot a little bit. Uh, but we are working on all three of those situations and also we're still thinking about when this is all over and I hope it's sooner rather than later what does that transition back to quote unquote normal uh, look like but right now we're focused on those three areas the reason I picked the entry point that I did and I don't want anybody to get confused that we're not looking at those other ones is because that's where the guidance says we should start but we are certainly talking with our staff about the pros and cons of each and I think they all have pros and they all have cons not one is perfect Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, I kind of have a couple of questions. First, uh, thank you for the, uh, th thank you for you and your team for the work. Uh, it's clear that you're coming from a place of putting students first. There's no good options here. We're all trying to think about the best of bad options. Um, and so a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, in, in, the, in the event that a child cannot wear a mask due to a medical condition, what would the recommendation be in district or at home? What would that, what would that student be asked to do? So in the event a child cannot wear a mask, assuming they're not contagious, um, they would still be allowed to attend school. That child may be subject to additional temperature screenings. Uh, again, when we work with our nurses and the guidance from the health department, that, that's a question that we're working on with the health department. But if someone cannot wear a mask, uh, which I think we have to anticipate, it's, it's not going to be, you know, one kid per school. I think you can anticipate that there will be a number of students and or staff members, for whatever reason, aren't able to wear a mask but can still attend. Uh, they still have to meet the self-certification process before they go in, and they still have to self-certify. One of the questions we're asking for clarification on that one is can they still wear a face shield, which would not obstruct their breathing as much as a mask. Now, of course, any kind of child or adult who cannot wear a mask would have to have a note uh, from a doctor. And so one of the things that I, I, I didn't get to mention in the presentation, but the policy committee is going to have to convene within these next two weeks to recommend to the board a mask requirement for our school district and how that will be implemented and how that will be enforced. So that's a big piece of that. Um, and we would work with individual families um, on that. So for instance, I have a, a son with severe sensory uh, issues on the autism spectrum. Having him wear a mask all day is going to be very problematic. And we have a number of students in District 58 that are similar. Um, but a face shield might work. And so is that something that we can do? Um, and again, we would talk with their, the, the child's medical team. Makes sense. Um, I imagine a lot of uh, a lot of concerns with modified on-site come from the space of the event of community spread or the higher likelihood of potential community spread with being exposed to 
tens if not hundreds of families by being in the same building. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, do you mind walking through what the quarantine requirements would be in the event of a positive case? I'm guessing the positive cases are in the event of a student being positive, a teacher being positive, and then either of those cases, somebody at home being positive. Yes, that, that's correct. And so um, there's all sorts of issues that, that we have to deal with. I, I, again, I want to reiterate that whenever we leave our house during the pandemic, we're all putting ourselves at risk. It, it's what's the acceptable risk level that we're all willing to tolerate as a society. And I would tell you that decision is way above my pay grade. So I go straight to this guidance to tell me what is safe and what, what isn't safe. And so with the quarantine, and I'm very happy that the state put this Q&A uh, together because it walks us through exactly what you have to do. In addition, we would be contacting the health department with any positive case in our schools or a family member, and they also will walk us through exactly what we need to do. The health department has a commitment to get back to schools within 24 hours. I can tell you we've had several situations. Thank goodness they were all false alarms, but we've been dealing with these protocols since March. I know Jane is over there, and uh, uh, again, I don't mean to make light of it, but we've had several uh, potential situations where people had to do that. But just to read some of this, if you don't mind, to answer your question uh, directly, um, when must an individual self-quarantine? Individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19 or, or are suspected of having COVID-19 infection should seek medical attention, self-isolate, and follow CDC guidelines for discontinuation of isolation. Individuals who have had close contact with an individual who has tested positive for COVID-19 or suspected of having COVID-19 infection should isolate at home and monitor for symptoms for 14 days. Individuals who do, did not have close contact can return to school immediately after disinfection. So how do we define close contact? That's the next question on the Q&A. Close contact means the individual was within six feet of the individual who tested positive for COVID-19 or is suspected of having COVID-19 infection for more than 15 minutes. This is why the health department is so clearly articulated to us. You have to keep kids six feet apart to the greatest extent possible because it eliminates a lot of these potential situations. I will tell you, I don't expect any of our staff members in a blended model or an on-site model to sit there with a stopwatch and to figure out how long you've been next to a kiddo, right? Um, so if there's any doubt whatsoever, we would follow the conservative approach and make people self-quarantine. I can also tell you that one of the things that we will strongly suggest for our staff and our community is testing is, is readily available um, here in DuPage County. There is a free testing site at the county fairgrounds and that would be something that we would encourage everyone to do so they may not have to isolate for 14 days. I know the uh, plans are still coming on, if we approve this, the plans would still come on what, it, what school actually looks like. Um, yeah. The uh, questions on in our elementary schools where students are largely self-contained in individual classes i can see where that goes mm -hmm. uh, and what potential modifications we'd have to make there in terms of space uh, and, and in terms of re, re, uh, reorienting staffing but in middle school yeah. it's a significantly different experience right students are regularly changing classrooms as a part of their normal day what insight can you share around yeah. how you expect in a modified on-site to execute junior high so for those of us who have been in the middle school for a very long time, I, I think we need to picture what it was back when, when the middle school concept first originated and we were all on teams or clusters as we called them in, in District 58. And so your cluster, and again I'm being very general, uh, we would sit down with Matt Jabala and Amy Reed and the leadership teams at both schools to figure out exactly you know, what this can look like and what this should look like. All cards on the table though, the middle school is a tough thing to plan for just because of the logistics of how a middle school works, right? That's why many of the high schools are going to a blended model. But the, the, the cluster concept is you have a cluster of students. Back in the day, it was very nice. Uh, both Herrick and O'Neill were about 600 students, so we had four clusters at each school. Each cluster had about 150 students. And inside a cluster, you had a team of teachers that only taught those students. So I was a social studies teacher. There was a math teacher, there were two language arts teachers, and there were a science teacher. And we all shared the same kids. They were on the same wing of the school. 
and they went from my social studies class to Kelly Massimio's math class to Jim Herzing's science class and in the two ELA teachers. So imagine that, but the kids don't move. If I'm the social studies teacher, I go to group one for first period, I go to group two for second period, and so on and so forth. That is one example of how that might work. Another example of how that might work is a block scheduling approach. Um, I tend to shy away from block scheduling. It, it's a little harder on that, but that might be a model where on Monday you have language arts and social studies. On Tuesday, and, and the block is longer, on Tuesday you have science and you have mathematics and the block is longer. Um, that is a very common scheduling thing in some middle schools. It's also very common in some high schools. So that is one potential um, situation that you could have or develop. And then I wanted to get clarity around uh, some of the potential modifications in a modified onsite. Mm -hmm. um, one of the modifications I heard as potential, uh, and obviously this needs to be hashed out, is some families or some students uh, would be asked to be changing schools in that environment, right? So th that's possible. Yes. We don't know if that's actually going to happen, but that's possible. Um, we expect there's going to be uh, a need to change classrooms and the orientation of what a physical layout of a building looks like. Mm -hmm. um, we expect that there's a possibility that some teachers would be ch changing the subject or grade level that they teach in that environment. Uh, and then uh, it's very likely that we would have to change the schedules of when school starts, when classes end, uh, what the day, how the day unfolds in terms of you know bell schedules. Are those all accurate in terms of like in essence fixed costs that we would have to quote unquote pay for a modified on-site plan? That is 100% correct. Everything that you mentioned and then then some you would have to do in order to achieve a modified on-site program. Is there a uh, scenario with the blended model? where those fixed costs are reduced? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I certainly think a blended model is easier to plan for and easier to implement on site. Um, now, when I say the word easy, please understand that's relative because none of this is, is, sure. is quote unquote easy, yeah. but putting things into perspective. Um, where I think the blended is a lot easier is, first of all, you have half the students in the building, right? So, so that in itself logistically can be an easier um, model. You also are basically running your same day that you normally would um, with a reduced number of students in your classroom. The fixed costs that I think you have to pay there are you're not getting through um, as much curriculum as you would be able to get through because obviously the students are there in person half the time. The other thing that is very tricky to get over is yes, we would have a remote option, but I think it's, it, it, it's a very challenging, almost impossible task to ask teachers to teach to the first half of the alphabet um, in person and then remotely um, to the second half of the alphabet. We would have to figure out exactly what that remote should look like and how could we make that manageable uh, for our teachers um, and, and for our support staff who are going to be assisting with that because they would have to assist us with that. So again, um, I, I think you made a very um, good point where we talk about none of these things, if I were designing schools from scratch, would I pick, right? Because they're all very, very challenging um, until this pandemic is over. Kevin, if I could, it's Justin, if I could just add one, one thought sure. to that. One of the other things that, and it, it also ties back to, to Tracy's question around, you know, why would we recommend modified over blended? And I think the other thing that we, we need to remember that we gain in the modified on-site instruction, assuming that we, it, it, we, we determine that it is fully feasible, is we, gain, we regain daily contact between our students and our teachers and, and across the board. And I think that is something that, you know, we don't want to lose sight of in all of this. There are, you know, as students get older, they are they will tolerate a remote learning or a distance scenario 
in different ways. But certainly when we think about elementary students and our youngest learners, that daily contact, that daily routine, that consistency, that building of connection between teacher and student is, is a really critical component of education. And I think that that's, that is something that, again, working under the assumption that we, if we find that modified on-site is truly feasible will be a tremendous benefit that really needs to remain on our minds in all of this. And, and, and just to, to jump in there, I think that's why you're, you're seeing many of our neighboring districts really jump on that first to, to see if they can really make that happen. So the model that we're describing here in, in a modified on-site is the exact same model that Woodard 68 is trying to deploy and CenterCast 66 is trying to deploy. Uh, my children attend Lyle 202. They're deploying that, although they have a, a, a different situation with two empty buildings. Uh, that would be a very nice problem to have right now. Uh, but, um, you know, no matter what, parents and families are going to have to make sacrifices. I got an email uh, last week, and, and basically it told me that um, five of my seven children would be attending five different buildings next year on five different schedules. And, and so I want all of our parents to know I'm not only you know, working at this, but I'm living this as a parent. So I get it as we're going through these things. And I do have a couple more questions, but I'll, I'll yeah. save them. And if somebody else wants to chime in. I have a couple questions. Kevin. Sure. Um, you talked about busing and how buses would potentially be a place where six foot distancing would not be able to be achieved just because of the nature of mm -hmm. a school bus. Um, how, what, what sort of a plan do you have for ensuring that kids are going to be keeping their masks on on the bus, especially since they will not be six foot distancing? That's yeah. So I'm not going to pretend to sit here and tell you with elementary kids that I can guarantee that they are going to keep their mask on. Um, ironically, I think we have a much better shot at that than the high school does for a variety of reasons. But um, one of the things that we work very closely with first student on, and, and again, I, I recognize what I'm about to say, the, the bus driver has to monitor the road as well. Uh, but one of the things that we do with elementary students and even middle school students is every year we talk to them about bus etiquette. We talk to them about what our expectations are, how they need to behave on the bus. Our bus drivers help enforce that. Um, and that's why we tell our kids they have to sit in their seats. There, there's no rough housing on the bus, all of those other things. Um, all of our buses also have cameras on there as well. And so if we had situations where we had children repeating this type of behavior or refusing to wear a mask in school, we would address that in a normal uh, course like we would address any other uh, infractions that we would have at any one of our schools. Uh, but how would I ensure enforcement? We would be working with our students. We would be going over expectations. We would be working with our bus company on how to make sure that our bus drivers reinforce that in, in through monitoring um, with our building leaders. Okay. Um, another question I have is, is uh, like in terms of uh, staffing, in terms that you, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to need additional, like you talked about potentially using non-classroom teachers in more classroom teaching type of roles in this situation, if you're going to have needing additional sections created at, at various grade levels and in, in various schools. Um, what type of staffing concerns do you have in being able to fill all of those positions? And also, not only just that, but um, potent, the potential, or not even potential, but pretty much expected need for subs throughout the course of, of this model as teachers either become infected with COVID or are just sick in any other way and need a substitute. I'm wondering what the, you know, are, are subs going to be knocking down the door to come into a school to sub in this environment and what kind of concern do you have in terms of staffing? So I'm going to quickly let Jane uh, jump in and, and talk about staffing. So um, before I, I turn it over to Jane, though, our model right now, um, and again, we want to sit down with our staff to talk about how does this make sense, right? How do we limit the number of traveling teachers between buildings? How do we limit the same teacher? Um, we've had several conversations already with our specialist teachers, but to talk to them about, you know, what that might look like if we're asking them to assist. You know, we have to talk to reading specialists. We have to talk to a whole host of staff who may be non-classroom teachers to figure out how all this, um, you know, could, could work in the long run. Um, we've got ideas, but one of the worst things that we could do is to sit down with a principal and a, um, you know, a team of teachers and say, here, this is your final plan. I want to hear from our principals in their school to say, you know what, 
this is the overview. I got it. I, I, I can make this work utilizing X staff member in this. And of course, we would have to have some really good conversations with our associations about, you know, what would be um, ideal for everyone involved in that uh, situation. Because I do feel for any staff member who is of the mindset that they're coming into school year looking at this and all of a sudden it becomes this, right? We have to think about that. In terms of our staffing though, with non-classroom teachers, we certainly feel comfortable that we would have enough to cover this, otherwise we wouldn't have said go in this direction. Having said that, one of the things that is going to be a challenge even under normal circumstances is the availability of substitute teachers. We are in the midst of the worst sub shortage ever. Um, and you know, we're lucky here in the western suburbs because when I go to Springfield and talk about the lack of subs, I get laughed out of the room because they can't find teachers. I can tell you being here in Downers Grove, our district has a great reputation and we tend to attract some really good substitute teachers, especially those who are just finishing college and maybe looking for their first uh, teaching job. But Emily, I think your concern is a legitimate one. I think it's a valid concern and it's one that we are concerned about because staffing is tough in 2020 under regular conditions, but staffing is certainly tough. That would be one of those insurmountable examples that Justin shared that if we get all of this data back and we can't staff it, well then we have to come back to the Board of Education and say that we may have to pivot. It may not be everybody has to pivot. It, it, it could be perhaps a, uh, the seventh and eighth graders or, you know, so, so we need to talk about that and we need to flush that out. That's why those surveys go out to our staff members, uh, hopefully tomorrow evening or Wednesday morning to really see just how many uh, we would have with medical conditions that wouldn't be able to work. But again, we could redeploy those staff in other areas where they didn't have to come in contact with kids. So there's some creative solutions there, but um, to answer your question generally in terms of staff, we do have concerns, but I'll let Jane weigh in as well. And, and, your, and the answer is exactly <laughs> as Kevin. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> uh, really, as we think about our, our classroom staff, we also have I mean, we have roughly 400 certified staff members. So really this next two weeks is so critical with surveying our staff, getting a sense on potential medical certification. So there's one group of, of people. Um, and then talking personally with the individual groups, the non-classroom teaching groups, our PE teachers, our interventionists. Our, we would want to spend some time with each group to talk about and look at what are those options for shifting people into a classroom, looking at certifications, um, get feedback from our staff and get their input on how can this work, what are some things we could plan for. I think then too we'll have a better, a better sense of where are we short, is this feasible, um, working with our ESP association and our, talking to our instructional assistants about, as we prioritize, you know, if that's what it's really going to come down to is let's figure out where the greatest need is, where we may be short, then reprioritize how we're um, allocating staff, what's most important, and then come back really with a, a more detailed plan as to what that means. As far as subs, yes, it's a, it's a concern even prior to the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, we do have 200, we have over 200 subs on our current list, and we do, one nice thing is we have people reaching out now knowing, you know, given what's going on in our in the schools, um, wanting to be added to the sub list. The regional office has just sent out um, some quick, some short term sub approvals, <coughs> some training so we can add to our sub list. And so we will be um, absolutely pursuing any options there. But really, again, it goes back to this, two weeks is real critical, working with the very people that will help us make the decisions, which would be um, our building administrators, teaching staff, and our support staff as well. I'm not sure if that gives you enough of an answer. Yeah, no, but thank you. Um, if we were to do a blended model of some sort, um, would there still be a need for non-classroom teachers to take on classroom teaching roles? Or, or would reading specialists be able to remain reading specialists and PE teachers be able to remain PE teachers and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, and, and so first I want to be careful there because we haven't developed exactly which teachers oh, yeah, are we just, but, but your, your question, and Justin, feel, feel free to jump in, but I'll answer it in general terms. The answer is 
No, you're following pretty much the, the same school day, but in kind of a, a day on, day off type of a, a model with one day that week being fully uh, remote. However, the same set of circumstances for quarantine and all those other things mm -hmm. would apply. Mm -hmm. So I'm not comfortable, even in regular schools, like there, there are days where the principal, and, and um, it's one of the things I have to compliment all of our principals. When I was a principal, we did not have a sub shortage. Our principals every day, from the time they wake up, many of them at 5, 5.30 in the morning, the first thing they do is they check who's out today and how many subs do I need. They then work with all the teachers in the building to cover. At our middle schools, we've got internal subs, same thing at the elementary school. So that is a, a, a way of life. And on some days, we have to go to the physical education teacher. We have to go you know, to the art teacher and maybe not run a special because we have to cover. So I can't say that would never happen. Sure. Um, certainly the modified on site makes the presumption that you're doing that all the time anyway. The blended would, would make the assumption that no, you're doing business as usual, but the kids are only there a couple of days a week. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, all, all I would, again, just add to that is it, it's business as usual, but half or a third of the time, right? And so the, what's happening for those students on the days they're not on site may also very well be other certified staff members asked to take part in some of that, you know, that, that, that opposite on site remote portion, depending on what that may look like. I, I think that's the other important consideration, that on site instruction is going to be from, you know, wh while it may be from the, the typical grade level or content area teacher, it's going to be 50% of the time at best and more likely something like 35% of the time when we start to look at what the, what the, what the models would actually look like. And so while, while it, you know, it, 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 it may not require the same level of reallocation of certain of staff members and, and taking on of different roles or, or creating different teams and groups, it certainly, there is a whole other side of that that we haven't built out yet to be able to confidently say exactly who would be responsible for which elements of, of the curriculum during that portion that was not on site in a hybrid model. Thank you for that, Justin. That's a great point. Similar question about um, custodial maintenance staff. Um, I'm assuming that there's probably going to be a need for an increasing, increasing our numbers in the custodial maintenance staff just to be able to uh, keep up with the, the required cleaning and things like that. And do we, is there any concerns or are you happy to be able to fill the positions needed in that area as well? Yeah, I, I think there's always a concern with having uh, the amount of custodial staff uh, that we need. Um, it is one of a, 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 one of the positions in our school district that we, we see a higher frequency of turnover. I can tell you right now that the administration is working very hard to fill all of our current vacancies, but that would be a great example. And even starting tomorrow when we sit down with our custodial association to really hear from them, what would you need with this enhanced cleaning uh, to make it work and what positions do we have to identify uh, potential of overtime those types of things so um, again I would say there's staffing concerns across the board in any model that we do uh, but right now we're, we're actively trying to fill the positions that we have and um, then see if we need to identify uh, more and in, in recruit those and that would be one where I would have to come to the board and, and say look we need to hire additional staff for this school year mm -hmm. and we may have to do without something because again when you look at those safety protocols cleaning is one of those non-negotiables and enhanced cleaning that we have to make sure uh, that we do so right now the focus is on filling all of those positions that we have over the summer and then identifying if we need more or what overtime we would need to make this work and again that, that's a, a lot of conversations with Angie and Jason of the association and uh, you know with Kevin and Jeff as well I just have one. Is it? Um, as we talk about, um, and it popped up multiple times during, there is a definite difference when we're using the word remote learning in the different scenarios, yes. correct? So remote learning in a phase one where everyone is at home, that curriculum, the way it is taught, is going to be very different than a remote learning in a in a hybrid the blended and that's also a hundred percent different than if a family chooses to keep their child home for whatever reason and the acellus that is a completely third different remote 
learning option, correct? You are correct and because one of the things we're so trying. So they're all very different. They're all very different okay. and very unique because the requirements of our teachers and support staff are, are different, different in each model, right? So when we have full on site, there's no way a teacher then can offer a completely parallel curriculum. And we don't have any support staff to right. support that at that point, right? Because we're in an all hands on deck. Even in a blended model, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Craig. I, I don't know how he teaches his fourth graders right. this and then the other ones online, right? That, that becomes a very uh, challenging situation. So there, as Justin said, we might have to use some support staff and even do some of that. Uh, a cell that's maybe for a subject area or something like that. Um, I'm just thinking moving forward that maybe we want to call them different things yeah. because I think in the community or as a family or a parent that's not in the room, um, just by saying remote learning or I'm going to go with remote learning is going to be very different depending on the scenario and if we yeah. use the same terminology and they're not the same then that is going to cause confusion yeah. and possible heartache where there needs not to be. And, and Jill I, I agree and I'll go, I'll go one better. I think also when people think of remote learning they think of the spring right and, right. and, and it has and to look different than what it looks in the spring. So. I appreciate that because one of the things the guidance says, and we know um, in, in, we're in danger because we're moving so fast, right? Every school yeah. district is. Communication is so essential, and all it takes is one word to be there or not to be there, and, and you can see a lot of people, um, you know, that anxiety builds up. So I appreciate that because we are going to have to have very clear communication about what each one of these is and what each one isn't. Thank you. Can Greg, hold on a second. Greg was. Yeah, I'm going to jump in if I can, actually. Go ahead. Is, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Darren and um, Dr. Russell and Dr. Ike Miller for allowing me to participate in this meeting remotely. As uh, my fellow board members know, I'm out of state and not physically able to be there right now. Um, but obviously, I want to participate because of just the, the, the serious importance of this conversation. So thank you all for that. Um, regarding that, that great long presentation we got from the administration, there's a couple of things I wanted to touch base on. Um, obviously, uh, to Dr. Russell and to Justin, thank you for um, acknowledging that we are hewing very closely to the guidance that's been given to us and, and, and pointing out when we have local control and pointing out when we do not. Um, thank you for putting safety of our students and staff first and foremost. Um, I believe that everybody, that everybody has um, different points of view as to what our next path should be, but we are all in agreement that safety is our greatest priority for all of our stakeholders. Uh, thank you, Dr. Russell, for um, acknowledging our mission statement. Um, I think that's extremely important. And also to both of you gentlemen for recognizing um, that, uh, I think, um, Kevin, you said that um, in-person instruction is far superior to remote instruction. And, and Justin, you said that's a stronger instructional option. I, I agree wholeheartedly with both of you um, that, um, despite the Herculean efforts of our of our staff, um, inter, you know, remote learning was just something that we should all be proud of and how we um, organized around that in the spring. But we, I still believe that in-person instruction is, is a superior option when we're talking about um, what, what, how to meet the needs of our students, how to get the best outcomes for our students. Um, my one question, though, is um, around the, the opportunity to provide options to families uh, as to what they would choose to do for their for their children in the fall, some families would provide with an option for um, in, in person instruction potentially, and also some families who feel that they would prefer to to not expose their their children to risks at school will be provided with the opportunity to um, keep their children home and engage in remote learning. I guess my question is, how firm of a commitment do we need from families? What happens if a family tries out remote learning? Um, for a couple of weeks and you said, I'm not satisfied with this. Mm -hmm. um, are, are we going to allow back and forth between the two options? I mean, what if, I guess I'm, I'm foreseeing a scenario where we are, um, we're crunching kids in and we are stuffed to the guilt of students, but then some families want to come back. Are we going to allow that? Um, uh, do we have to uh, uh, expect families to, to make some kind of commitment to remote learning or how is that going to work when, you know, we, we kind of need to have some numbers in terms of where our, our kids are going to be, how many are going to be in the buildings, how many are going to be out of the buildings, and are we, if, if the, those numbers in the buildings creep up and become at a level where our kids are no longer safe, we can't keep six feet, et cetera, et cetera, then what do we do? So I'm and that is a great question, and I'm kind of chuckling because I think Greg may, must have been on one of those superintendent calls because that is certainly a question that all of us have, right? Um, 
how optional is mandatory school? And so you never really think about those. Um, so, uh, Member Harris, what we would be looking at is a commitment from our families on a trimester basis. That, that's where we would start. Um, now, there are some interesting legal uh, questions that um, all superintendents are still seeking guidance on in terms of whether or not it's permissible to come and go. Under current um, law, that could theoretically take place where you have a parent or, or family enroll their children in August, they take them out in September, bring them back in October, and throughout my career it's been limited, but I have seen situations um, like that. I, I, I've seen people who may be dissatisfied with something that took place in the school. They say they're going to homeschool and then perhaps they're back a, a, a few weeks later. Those are rare cases. Um, I would tend to think if a family has that big of a health concern that they wouldn't be rushing back I into the building. But nevertheless, that could happen. Um, one of the things that I would remind um, everyone is that we do have an option, and this is one that we are exploring, in that situation while we're staffing in a blended or in a uh, modified on-site for all those students who are registered. If they do decide to come back and there isn't enough room in that particular building, we do have the option of transferring. And, and so that could be an option where you have room at one school but not another one. And so we would have to talk about that and make sure that our policy aligns with that. But that could be one way around um, overflowing one particular school. And that's why I think it's important to make a, a, at least a trimester commitment um, to that in terms of the legality and how you can hold someone to that commitment. It is a public school and um, you're not going to win many of those arguments about keeping kids out of a public school. However, where you choose to educate them inside of that school, um, you do have some flexibility in that, but we would have to really work with our attorney, the ROE, and then also our policy committee to make sure that we are protected in that area. Did that answer there? Okay, thank you. Question? Yes, thank you. Correct. Yeah, do you mind going back to uh, Member Samante's question around the different versions of remote? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like in the modified on-site, the remote option for families that choose to opt for that would be a SELUS learning. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the remote flavor in each of the other options? What does fully remote look like? What does blended look like in the remote part of blended? So, so I, again, I can tell you where thinking is at yeah. uh, right now. There is a, a difference when you're in a blended uh, situation for, uh, I'll call it three situations, are, are students that have opted for on-site instruction in a blended model, right? They're gonna get instruction from their teacher and then they're gonna get remote instruction um, from District 58 staff on-site. Um, the second option though, that family who still with, didn't withdraw from the school district but said, you know what, I'm not having my, right now what we're looking at is, is more of an Acellus uh, platform for them or I'm still talking with some of our neighboring districts who are allowing that remote option for that every other day, right? And so, so that could be something that, that we could allow happen in, in, in that situation in addition to a, a, an Acellus learning. The third option would be a medically fragile student. That's where you sit down with the team and the family and Jessica will work out a plan uh, that, that suits that individual family on an individual basis. So those are, are, are your three options. But right now, a lot of school districts are, if they're in a blended model, this is more of a high school model, um, because many of them have already gone to that, are allowing that family to opt in at least to the remote portion and not <coughs> um, only uh, an online uh, program like Acellus. And Kevin, if, if I could just chime in there too, mm -hmm. I think Karab, as you're speaking to what would what would that you know what would the remote component of each of those plans look like? I think again, I'm just going to say that's exactly what we are looking to build in the next few weeks because, as Kevin mentioned earlier, even a fully remote plan would not be able to be the same as what our remote learning plan was in April and May because the requirements already have changed in terms of what the components of that plan need to be. Similarly, the remote components of a blended plan would still need to be developed and, and identified in, in greater detail. But what we do know is that it, it, would, it would look different than what that fully remote plan would be for all of the reasons that have been mentioned this evening. Anything else from anyone else? I have another. Okay, go ahead. Uh, it's more of a comment, I guess. Um, this is just a suggestion, but 
Uh, over the weekend, I actually, I was talking to a friend who works at Trader Joe's. And I consider Trader Joe's to be an exemplar and a, a company that handled coronavirus, uh, keeping a bunch of like customers and employees in mind. And I asked him what, how, like what made him say to, d during the heat of it, like what made him feel comfortable going to work and so on. I would maybe make a suggestion in the working groups for the things like, there's one thing to talk about in all these working groups with the staff about arrival and everything else, but like things that they need, like things that will help make this the best experience possible for everybody. <laughs> And um, <coughs> so that may not look like asking about what would the lineup look like to get into the school, but the day-to-day -day things in the classroom and things that they need to be prepared for the day. Yeah, <coughs> and, and I appreciate you bringing that up. And, and that is, there, there's a difference between logistics and, and feeling secure and feeling safe. And, and that, while that is subjective, I do think that's one of our, our duties to ask. I was, I was just talking with a member of our, our teachers association earlier before the meeting. Um, we're meeting with all three of our associations in, in, before we send out the staff survey, <coughs> precisely for that reason, um, to make sure that we're getting it right, to make sure that we can all agree on questions, uh, not just the logistical questions, also those soft questions, right, that, that would make people feel uh, more comfortable well, that's one of the things that I've always loved about District 58. I always felt that people valued um, how I felt about coming to work, and that's certainly something that we don't want to lose. I can tell you, um, I, it was such a great weekend in, in many ways, and it was the longest weekend of my life in, in, in other ways. Um, so yes. I think we all felt that uh, up here, and I, I know many of you in the audience uh, felt that as well. But even in the midst of this, with, with our teachers um, and, and our support staff feeling so nervous about the upcoming school year, I can't tell you how many people texted or called or asked how I was doing and, and, and all of that. And so um, even in the midst of all this, we can't even agree if, if we're struggling to figure out what this can look like. People still care about each other it's in the school element. district. And, and I, I, I worry in any of these situations that we lose that. I, I also worry about that in a remote setting or for full remote because our, our, our staff were told on a Friday, you can't come back on a Monday, and by the way, reinvent your entire career, right? And there, you're all alone sitting in your home trying to figure that out. And, and so there is a ton of value in, in that human connectedness and, and how we can make people feel more comfortable. It could be a simple thing that would make someone feel more secure, and, and we need to hear that from our staff. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, kind of to wrap up, I do, I do just want to say, I. I have been more contacted in the last few days than I think I have my entire time serving on the board. Oh, four um, years. What? <laughs> four years. Yeah, I, I'll probably combined, right, in, yeah. in, in these couple of weeks. Um, I think I've spoken to you more than my wife. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it has certainly been a busy time. And, I, you know, this, this whole time has been very strange and it, at times scary and everything like that. And I remember sitting down and talking with my kids and reminding them of that um, quote from Mr. Rogers' mom, you know, w when you're scared and you're in these places, you look for the helpers because oftentimes you'll see the people helping. And I, and I just want to commend, I think, this district for a while that I, I really feel like we got a lot of helpers in this district. I think that we have, um, I'll mention it later when, when I say the DLT update, but the positive attitude that was in that room of, of we got guys up in Apollo 13 <coughs> and we got to figure out how we make this air filter work in this thing with this box of junk, right? And, 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 and how do we do that? And I know that's a, that's a big thing that we have uh, on our shoulders right now. And I wanna commend um, the, the midnight oil that all of you guys have been burning um, to try to make this, this possible. So, so thank you for that. Um, I think it's important to just recognize that, that we're trying to balance a lot <coughs> of things here. You know, yeah, we're talking about academics, but we're talking about the mental health of our children. We're talking about their social emotional supports that they might need. We're talking about services for 504s and IEPs and, and our English language learners and, and stuff like that. And we're, and we're trying to talk about ways to shrink the groups of people that, these, that our students and our faculty are, are going to be around. And we're trying to do all of this while balancing this high level of service with creating the safest environment possible by mitigating a lot of risk. And, and that's not an easy undertaking. And, and so when I think about this, I talked with a couple families over the weekend, and one of the things they're worried about is, is they are, they're back to normal. And I'll tell you, somebody that's commuting right now, 
the traffic, I've seen a major shift. It's starting to move where people are expected to be back in the office. And when they read that five hour requirement per day, 25 hours a week, the impact that that's gonna have on their family when they don't have a parent that can be there. Mm -hmm. um, and what that's gonna mean for the equity for their children um, and everything else was a big, big concern for them because if their kids are in daycare or even at grandma and grandpa's house or wherever mm -hmm. it might be that they're at, they may not be able to, to provide the supports to help them through that five hours of work and starting it at, after dinner time at night is very difficult. There was also a, a point that someone made to me regarding um, the blended model and the fact is we don't know where these kids have to spend their day when they can't be with us. So not only now do we have an equity problem for the days that they can't be in, can they contribute to that, that five hours, but what other groups then are they, they going with? And, and by creating an environment where we create an in-person environment here where we, we try to balance all of these, safe, you know, these safety concerns and all of these other components, um, a lot of families I was speaking to have the ability to adjust their day to maybe pull off if they have a traditional school day without having to then expose their children to other locations as well. So those were some of the comments I got that haven't been the same ones that I've been, we've been getting in email and I thought they were very compelling and, and I did want to mention them because um, we worried a lot about equity when we, when we, had to, when we were forced to scramble um, into uh, e-learning at the end of the year. Um, I remember talking about the potential need to have a remote learning plan uh, and I thought for grade school it was ridiculous quite honestly I've never been more wrong about something in my life I think now we realize we have to be ready for everything and so um, yes we're gonna have to figure out some of our terminology because uh, fully remote learning is, is gonna be a very different option than when we have to have remote options tied in with something else I think communication is gonna be incredibly important I'm, I'm very curious to get the, the survey portion started. I'm looking forward to, to spinning up the staff in this next phase. Uh, I know you guys had a couple of weeks to put this logistically together based on, on working with, with the experts. Uh, it, the IS, uh, ISB and, um, and the, DuPage, uh, um, the DuPage County Health Department and, and the Illinois uh, Department of Health and stuff as well. So mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward now getting our, our staff back in place and, and hearing how we can try to fig figure out how to fit that, that square filter mm -hmm. into that round port. And so uh, thank you, and thank you for everybody that's gonna have to be involved with that. I, I wanna let you know that we all know this is a, an incredibly difficult undertaking, and, um, and uh, it, it, you know, just, we, we wish you the best of this, and we're, we're listening hard, and we're trying to do everything we can to, to, to treat our staff with the utmost respect and to make sure that we're providing the best possible services to our our families uh, and, and specifically the students that have to come in. So, so thank you for that, that high level of work. And uh, that's it for me. Anything else? Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick clarification. Will we have a chance to continue potential discussion during the action item after having heard public comment? There will be a, discu mm -hmm. there will be a discussion. OK, great. Bart. Thank mm -hmm. you. <clears throat> All right, listed on tonight's agenda are seven communications received from the board. Are there any additional communications board members would like to share at this time? No. No. All right, then we have a couple of reports to the board. We're going to go ahead and start with the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. It's me again, everyone. Um, <laughs> didn't give you much of a break there, did you? <laughs> I promise that uh, this will not be a typical report. It will be uh, very short. Um, just, just a few updates. Uh, I want everyone in the community to know, I, I, I've received emails, um, phone calls this weekend, both very supportive, um, but also some that you know, would suggest that we're not concerned about the safety and well-being of our students, or we're not concerned about the safety and well-being of our staff. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is absolutely the most important thing to all of us um, but good people can look at this guidance differently but the safety and well-being is exactly why we're all here no one would ever 
place anyone in danger intentionally, uh, whether that is a student or whether that is a staff member. So on behalf of the Board of Education, myself, all of our staff, we are always looking out for what is in the best interest of our students and our staff. We might not always agree on that, but I can assure you uh, that is exactly where we're all coming from. Um, that's mm -hmm. why uh, everyone loves to be in District 58 because it is such a family atmosphere. And uh, of all the things that I received this week, and I would say that by far would be uh, probably the most hurtful because nothing is further uh, from the truth. Uh, we are committed to working with our staff so everyone feels uh, safe in, in an environment that kiddos can learn in. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit and talk about finance. Um, at the August board meeting, that is when we will approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 21. I don't envy uh, our chief school business official, Todd Drayfall's tasks this school year, knowing a lot of the added costs that we're going to have due to COVID-19. What I anticipate is passing a budget uh, that may not look like a typical budget. We, we don't have all the defined costs yet. Um, so there may be situations where we have to come back further in the year and have an open and honest conversation about our community about things we might not be able to accomplish in FY21 simply because we had to spend so much money on the front end uh, for whatever plan that we're in. So know that we're looking very hard at the budget. Uh, Todd and uh, Katie Hannigan have done a great job initially, but um, that's the normal work of the summer. That's usually what we talk about at, at, at this meeting, but we are still uh, proceeding with that. I also want to talk about facilities. Uh, all of our summer work is on schedule. We're extremely pleased about three big projects that we have going on right now. The Highland Gym floor uh, is on schedule. And I also want to highlight and, and thank our parents at both Lester and Puffer uh, for all the hard work that they've done mm -hmm. raising funds for their playgrounds. I would encourage everyone to drive by, uh, especially Puffer this week. Puffer is doing a community build, and hopefully by the end of this week, they will uh, have a new playground at their school. So we're very excited in, in the community portion of that is uh, something I, I, I really like to highlight in, in you know not just those two schools but all of our schools I want to highlight um, the work that's being done to raise money for our children uh, it just doesn't take place at those schools um, Highland is making significant progress and even our schools that might not be able to raise uh, that much money every little bit helps for our schools and so I want to thank all of our parents and staff who uh, do that one of the conversations we were supposed to have this evening, and I respectfully asked the board president to delay that by a month, was the personnel uh, conversation regarding class size <clears throat> and when we would decide to split classes. I think if anyone um, sat through the last two hours, they would understand why it makes sense to delay that conversation right now. Um, we certainly have not forgotten about that though, because I do know that that is something that is near and dear to all of our families. They wanna make sure that their children uh, are in a very small class to the greatest extent possible and also to our teachers as well. So we haven't forgotten about that, but it wouldn't make sense to make that decision yet before we've made a decision about the direction we're headed uh, as a school district. So those conversations will take place in August. They may look a little different uh, depending on um, where we end up. So that is it for the superintendent's report. Um, I also want to uh, thank everyone personally who is here tonight. Um, it is great to be back at the Village Hall and, and try and get some sense of normalcy. Darren and I were, were, were talking about that. So uh, on behalf of all of us in District 58, thank you for coming out tonight because um, we appreciate how passionate you are about the school district. Fantastic. Any questions for Dr. Rosen? Mm -hmm. Great. Let's uh, move on to the monthly business and the treasurer's report with Mr. Drayfall. A longer walk over here <laughs> good evening um, this is you have the cash report for June 30th this is the end of the fiscal year on a cash base I'll call it modified cash basis because when you look at your year-to-date report and you compare it to your treasurer's report they're gonna be two different numbers treasurer's report reports cash uh, the year-to-date report has accrued all of the certified salaries for the payout of the contract um, for July and August and so you'll have a disparity of, of all of those benefits and all of those costs so you have as a modified cash because obviously when the modified uh, accrual audit comes out that is the actual uh, final end balance and, and there are, are some differentials um, year-end did not come in quite like we expected um, 
than we planned on initially. Uh, we had some revenues that did not materialize, obviously, um, even though we did make some, some marks and come in close at 100 percent on like interest income and some other areas. Uh, we actually really anticipated uh, those to be higher. We were conservative in those estimates. And uh, from March on, where we saw you know, those, those numbers drop, actually, I shouldn't say that, interest rates started dropping uh, back in, in, in December, I believe. So um, we also have some areas that certainly didn't materialize um, for the remainder of the year on revenue. And expenses we did, uh, knowing that we had some expenses that we didn't incur uh, for those last 50 days, uh, we did try to find areas that we w could pay <coughs> up for things that we knew we were going to have to uh, purchase uh, in to this fiscal year. So you've got some of those expenses that, that occur that have adjusted that. Overall, though, we did uh, end up uh, with a, a budget that is revenue over expenses um, for operating funds, which is always our, our goal. Um, it's always our goal. I will tell you it is highly unlikely that that will happen uh, for this next fiscal year. It's just the, you know, what we have to deal with, um, and we will certainly get in and, and have that at the next month. Uh, with an adoption by the board in September, and then be my recommendation that um, going into October and November, uh, we have uh, some conversations in earnest what fiscal year 22 uh, will look like and what we can do um, to mitigate uh, some of those some of those areas where we're going to have uh, some serious resource limitations. Uh, other than that, I, I will also add that the um, medical reserve fund uh, that had been talked about for the last several years as having an issue has certainly ended up in a much positive position. Um, one, because of active work by the Health and Wellness Committee over the last uh, year and a half, two years, uh, but also um, that has helped um, the last several months uh, that there's been severe limitations on normal uh, medical expenses. That should continue on. Um, obviously, as we have built our budget uh, for fiscal year 22, we anticipate a rate increase in January. Uh, depending on what that will do, will have some impact. In, and hopefully, that will help us as we move into the next fiscal year that we'll be able to find some savings in that area. Um, other than that, if there are any questions on the year-to-date report, we have a couple of uh, action items I uh, <coughs> just wanted to call the board's attention to uh, this evening. We have a contract extension for our special education transportation contract uh, with Sunrise. Uh, annually, the board must set the reimbursable lunch rate uh, for the National School Lunch Program. Uh, that is on there, as well as a uh, action item for surplusing of equipment. Uh, we will be using a public surplus uh, website that we will to send a picture and description in uh, they post out the items. Um, it's structured that the winning bid comes and, and picks up these items uh, from us. Uh, the, the check, you know, the, they, they take the deposit, they take a small percentage, uh, and it's a great way for us to go through that process, not having to, to do a, a sealed bid and a paper and all of that. It, it works out it, uh, really well, and it's, it's um, geared towards government sale, uh, surplus sales. So other than that, if there are any questions. No. Questions, Kevin? No. Thank you. Oh, just the is the kilns. Did we? Are we just getting rid of old ones? Do we still have them? Are we just curious? We are getting rid of. Um, they are the ones that we are getting rid of are no longer needed or can be used uh, operationally for programmatically. We do keep a couple for surplus parts for the ones that we are still. Having it like in the middle schools, I believe, and I believe that there is um, there's an item. I think the board had a, a, a something said. Justin helped explain um, the structure and the differential. They are at the at the middle schools, um, but they can't be properly hooded and, uh, at the at the elementaries at where they're at. So that's that's why those are there. Just, just double checking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
We're going to move on to our committee reports. Um, first up is our policy <coughs> committee, which did not meet, but we do have an item up to approve for first reading the policy 5 colon 222 tutoring and professional service providers. I don't know if you have any comments that you want to make on that, Jill? No. I haven't even had a, a chance to update Jill, so that's my <laughs> fault. I apologize. Um, like, nope, well, I later on in tonight's <laughs> agenda, we have the IESB full manual. This was one that they had forgot to put in, and we wanted to make sure that it, it mirrored our language. So we're not asking that one to be approved tonight, but that's okay. on me, Jill. I forgot to mention that to you, so I apologize. Okay, with that, is there a motion to approve for first reading policy five colon two 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 tutoring slash professional service providers as presented? So moved. Second. Great. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve for first reading policy 5 colon 222 tutoring slash professional service providers as presented. Next up would be the legislative committee, which did not meet in June. Uh, and then after that would be the financial advisory committee, which did meet on June 12th of 2020. We met remotely for that. And I could do a quick kind of update um, on that. Obviously, we spent a, a bit of time looking at the current state of our finances as well as some forecasting and to say things look different would be um, an understatement. Um, obviously our expenses were at the time were currently down but that was by, by changes because of COVID-19. You heard Todd mention that the MRF uh, was up and actually carrying a surplus uh, and while this is good news and some of it has been hard work we don't know how much of that has actually been impacted by the fact that um, healthcare costs have been down ultimately just because there's a, been a lot fewer doctor's visits. So we're going to have to kind of keep an eye on that and, and see what all of that actually means as, as we move forward. Another health care note that I had on here is that the, the district is planning on doing additional education uh, before open enrollment this year just to continue to, uh, that went over well um, before last open enrollment, so they're going to continue that. Um, and then also just another healthcare note is that there are enough people now in the ASA that allows us to get enough data back so that we will be able to um, set premiums based on the actual services that people are using with inside the HSA and not have to guess on that based on, on the primary plan that we have. Also, they've gone ahead and implemented uh, through our prescription benefits manager um, some of those cost saving measures that we had discussed in, in a previous meeting. Um, property taxes were set at 2.3% at for this year, so that will, uh, will continue, so that um, is, is, a, is a decent increase, but uh, state revenue, interest income, CPPRT, and all that kind of stuff is expected to be much lower um, than expected, so as, as Todd alluded to, fiscal year 22 and 23, 23 revenues are, are, are going to be down, and it could be an offset somewhere in the ballpark of a million and a half, so we're going to have to figure out um, what that means for us. Now, you've heard Todd talk about in the past is that there is a downtown TIF that will be falling off. However, we've also talked about other ways of utilizing <coughs> those funds. Uh, our, our goal was not to use that for, for operating funds, but really to use that for some of the other com upcoming expenditures that we had. So we're still going to have um, a challenge there. And, and with that, because, because of COVID-19 and the, the economic impact that has had, uh, we've had to put the pause button on the uh, facilities master plan, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some facility needs that are going to be coming up in the near future. So we are going to have to find a way to fund those, and that may uh, requiring borrowing some money or cutting some expenses or some kind of uh, combination of both. So just be prepared, I think, for, for those conversations um, coming forward. Uh, that concludes the report that I have, but I'll kind of uh, ask Member Olchek if he's got anything else to add from you, that meeting. You definitely covered it. I think, uh, you know, that was a month ago, and I think the topics that we're going to bring forward in FAC are going to be extremely fluid. Um, yeah. So kind of what we thought we were going to talk about August at that moment in time is going to be completely different. And so I think, uh, Todd, we're going to appreciate your agility <laughs> over the coming months. Yes, no doubt. Uh, any, any questions uh, on, on those topics? Fantastic. Uh, next up was the D district leadership team uh, met on July the 8th, uh, 2020. Uh, uh, representing the board was m myself and member Weiner. Um, 
The meeting that we went over today, I, first of all, the district leadership team meets quarterly, and our, our primary role is uh, to check on the progress of our strategic plan. <coughs> this was an opportunity to utilize the, the DLT in a, in a different format. Just because of the layout of that team, it was a good uh, team to work with to present the work of the uh, remote learning task force. And a lot of that presentation that we went through then um, is a good chunk of that was uh, what you saw today, plus they added additional items since our meeting. I did just want to tell you, I, I, so I don't have to go into any detail about that meeting, but I just want to tell you a little bit about how that meeting worked. Uh, we broke into small groups in that meeting. Um, we met over at Bel Air. And I just want to tell you, we, we had uh, some nice discussions about both the hybrid and the modified in-person models. We sat in, in small groups and we had uh, big pads that we kind of wrote uh, what we thought were the advantages uh, to the plan, um, what we saw as potential challenges in that plan, and then questions that we were going to have to have going forward when, when the plans actually started getting built out. I just want to say what a wonderful group meeting that was. Um, the level of cooperation and just general problem solving that was going on in that room was so greatly appreciated. It was, it was uh, nice to see that the team come together and know that, that we have a big task ahead of us and watching them try to, to work together to try to solve those problems so that we can um, figure out a way to educate our, our students come this fall um, was heartwarming. <coughs> and so I did want to take a moment and just acknowledge all the people that were part of that team. Um, Member Weiner, I don't know if you have uh, any other comments or? No, I think that's a good summary. Great, thank you. Uh, the Health and Wellness Committee did not meet in July. So that kind of wraps up our committees. Uh, and we have no additional discussion items tonight. Obviously, we were heavy loaded uh, up front. So at this time, this is now an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board. But this is not intended to be a time for members of the public. Members of the public, uh, where was that? To enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment <coughs> may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Please remember that criticisms of individuals is not in order. The board is allotted 60 minutes for public comment this evening. We ask that you keep your comments to two minute limit to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. Policy number 1150 states, at each regular board meeting, spe special open meeting, and board committee meeting, mm -hmm. the members of the public and district employees may share comments with the board or board committee, subject to reasonable constraints. Individuals appearing before the board or board committee are expected to follow these guidelines. Sign in and submit a card at the beginning of the meeting as an indication of interest in addressing the board during the board public comment portion of the agenda. Address the board only at the appropriate time as indicated on the agenda and when recognized by the board president. Any person addressing the board or board committee is asked to identify him or herself, state their school attendance area, and shall speak as briefly as possible. Ordinarily, comments shall be limited to three minutes <coughs> per person with a 30 minute time limit for public comment. In unusual circumstances, when an individual has made a request in advance to speak for a longer period of time, that individual may be allowed to speak for more than three minutes. Observe the president's decision to shorten public comment to conserve time, give a maximum number of individuals an opportunity to speak, and ensure the opportunity for multiple perspectives to be heard, including but not limited to times when several members of the public wish to speak on the same topic. Observe the board president's decision to determine procedural matters regarding the public <coughs> participation, not otherwise covered in board policy. And finally, conduct oneself with respect and civility towards others and otherwise abide by board policy. The board president or committee chair shall have the authority to determine procedural matters regarding public participation not otherwise in the board policy, including time limitations when appropriate. At this time, we have received six cards. We will ask each person who submitted the card to please come up to the podium, state your name and your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. In an effort to, everyone, to give everyone a chance to speak, if the substance of your comment mirrors previous comments, we ask that you keep your comment especially brief. After all who have submitted a card have had a chance to speak, we will read those submitted remotely. In the event that we run out of time to read all remote comments aloud, please know that we will be publishing all comments submitted remotely on the agenda in board docs if you would like to refer to them after the meeting. 
Should there be any time remaining, we will then take additional in-person comments. So, uh, Victoria, is it? I don't know. Is it Jack? What's the last Jack name? Now. Jack now, Jack. Um, from Pierce Downer. Yes. Hello. Uh, as you know, I'm Victoria. I'm, my son will be going into third grade at Pierce Downer, and I'm also uh, the VP of fundraising for the Pierce Downer PTA. Just a couple of questions. Um, obviously, this 50 people. They're mostly directed to you, Dr. Russell, sorry. Um, this 50 people doesn't apply to the building. It applies to the classrooms specifically. And Okay, I just wanted to double check on that. Have we decided or have you decided what is going to happen with temperature checks? I know you went over it somewhat for self, uh, excuse me, self-certifying versus doing it on site. <laughs> So before we, uh, yeah, go ahead. in public comment, we, we can't interact. And so just want to make sure we, if we're choosing to interact here, that we choose to interact for the duration of tonight? No. So what, yeah, I was just about to say, if, okay. if you, I will give an opportunity to, to give some clarity at the end. So if you want to state your, read your whole comment, and then if there's stuff that we feel we need to give clarity on, I'll have Dr. Russell do that at the time. Okay. The, the other thing that we will do as an administrative team is, is work to follow up with as many people as we can regarding their individual questions after a meeting. Okay. All right. Um, then I guess one thing that we just have not gone over at all is since we're not going to be able to, even with this modified on-site learning, we wouldn't be able to uh, branch off the kids into their small group learning clusters, as I guess you would call it. What about the kids that are going into advanced classes? Like my son in particular is going into advanced math. He's been doing the requirement over the summer through Excellus. What happens with him <clears throat> when he normally would then go into the fourth grade class during that math time? Mm -hmm. um, and I have a friend who is a custodian at one of the 58 schools. And he has mentioned to me that the custodian's hours are being cut and they're trying to hire part-timers so that they d can save money on not having to pay benefits. I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, and then, and if, if it is, then why are we doing that now <laughs> at all times? I mean, we kind of didn't really touch base on any sort of cleaning. Like, what's going to happen with that? How is it going to be planned out? Is there going to be a, a day allotted for, d for deep cleaning? How does it, you know, how do we go about all of that type of monster, basically? And I th think that's it. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much uh, you. for your comments. I, I, I want to make a quick statement on the fact that um, a lot of the stuff that, the questions that I'm hearing is stuff that ultimately is going to be what these next couple weeks are going to be about defining. So uh, much of what's been done has been the big picture work, um, working with the state, and, and we're about to step into a point where the rubber hits the road. I don't know if there's a couple of things that you want to address uh, directly here or if, or if you want to follow up as well. But also a lot of these questions that are coming up, the district will be creating a series of FAQs um, to answer a lot of this stuff because there's going to be a lot of questions coming up. So I did want to take an opportunity that stuff that's coming up here and we're also going to be do doing some surveying and stuff like that that ultimately will help us build uh, uh, an FAQ site that will be accessible uh, to the community at large. Craig Young with the DGEEA. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Craig Young. I teach fourth grade at Kingsley, uh, and I'm also the president of the DGEEA, our teacher union. Um, and I just wanted to spend just a couple minutes sharing the opinions of, of our, myself and, and many of my colleagues in our DGEA, uh, specifically regarding uh, agenda item 14B, the recommendation for board approval for modified on-site instruction five days a week for all students and staff uh, when we return to school this fall. Uh, and let me just start by saying I desperately want to be back at school with my students. 
Um, I know it's where I'm the most effective as an educator. It's no, I know that's where I can make the biggest difference. Um, it's so much more rewarding and, and uh, you know, you can find that success uh, when you're seeing students right in front of you. So I, I absolutely understand uh, the desire to be back at school in person. Um, however, I also believe that one of our highest priorities, if not the highest priority of our district is the, the health and safety of our students and our staff. Uh, right now, in this moment right here, I don't understand how it will be possible to safely go back to school um, for, for our staff and our students. I haven't seen the plan that, that Dr. Russell and, and other administrators have created. Um, none, none of us teachers have seen the plan, and we, of course, anxiously await that opportunity to do so. Um, but I do agree with much of what I've heard tonight. Um, the process that's been outlined, creating the working groups um, to pursue those three potential uh, approaches to instruction, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, even the, the idea that, that prioritizing on-site, modified on-site as, as that plan A, I, I do think if we can make it work, we, we should definitely try and pursue that avenue. Um, I guess what I'm really struggling with is just the directness of this action item that's on the agenda. Um, the, the language of the action item, and I'm just going to read it really quick, it says, recommendation for fall learning, modified on-site instruction, five days a week for all students and staff. W when I read that, to me, that says that the board is being asked to approve one single plan um, that will, would be a modified in-person instruction for the fall um, and like I had said that plan has not been seen by teachers um, it also hasn't been seen by principals ESPs or, or custodians um, these staff members haven't had that chance to vet these these plans to ask questions give input raise concerns problem-solve uh, how to make it work in in our classrooms and, and in our schools um, and you know well I, I agree with the process that's outlined that's going to give us that opportunity um, it just seems backwards to me that for the board to approve this single idea of the modified in-person instruction before that work has been completed. Um, you know, to me it doesn't make sense for the board to approve a plan that their stakeholders haven't had a chance to do that necessary work to really make sure that the plan is fully developed and in, in practical application that it's something that the board agrees with. You know, making sure that you know what you're voting on it, I always feel is an important piece. Um, and so, you know, to that end, I'd like to humbly offer an alternative uh, just to ensure that all of our plans are, are fully vetted without any preconceived notions of, of what plan the district might go with. Um, so an alternative would be, be to amend tonight's action item um, and either, you know, we could approve the process or direct staff to pursue the modified plan as one of the three options. Um, and really, I, there was language in the, in the presentation at the beginning of the meeting um, I think it was slide 21, I tried to write it down. Uh, but it said, the administration would like to recommend to the board that we pursue the feasibility of having students and staff come back to school under a modified on-site instructional plan. I mean, I believe that that language just more accurately reflects uh, the intent that the board has tonight. Um, I, I know I've heard you all speak about the process that you, excuse me, the process that you wanna go through um, the working groups being created. So to me, that language that was on that slide really spoke directly to what the intent is. Um, I, I would be in support of, of really looking at that language um, as a potential amendment to the proposed language. Um, but of course, I mean, the DGEA, we are excited to roll up our sleeves and get to work on all of these approaches and find ways to, to make them work. Um, so, you know, let's just honor our staff and uh, the collaborative relationship that we've had throughout the, this whole pandemic. Um, and let's make sure that the process that we create is, is respected and, and not, you know, prematurely approve a plan before the staff people who will be tasked with implementing it have had a chance to uh, give that input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Emily Hahn with the DGESP. Hi, I'm Emily Hahn. I'm a, a library assistant at Herrick, and I am the president of the uh, Downers Grove Educational Support Personnel. 
I had a statement that I was going to read, but basically it, um, it reflects everything that Craig has requested, and we too request the same action uh, based on the fact that we are just now going to be beginning to work in those working groups. We are going to be meeting with administration tomorrow to begin that process, and we too respectfully ask you to you know, hold off a vote until a more accurate and realistic plan has been decided upon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Angie with the DGCMA. Hi everybody. Um, I've been up here before and I stand behind what I've always said when I've worked with all of you. It's been always a pleasure to work with you. We've always agreed to disagree. Um, I agree though with Craig and Emily that we need to get more specific before you vote on something to say that it's going to be in stone and I realized that as we were talking along here we've agreed that there's a lot of work to be done excited to do it excited to try to make it work because we are all are here for the same thing we're here for the kids and yes kids are going to get the best learning experience possible if they're in the classroom everybody wants to be in the classroom but we really need to work on a lot more things before we just assume that we're going to be able to get there I think we have a great team. I think everybody's on the same page and everybody wants to get to that point. I would just also respectively like you just to put off that vote, to put anything in stone, and also let it be known that Kevin's a wonderful leader. I respect him. I know everybody that works with him respects him. It's a great idea, but right now, there's not enough specifics that we've gone over as a group to see how it would work. So I thank you for letting me come up here and say that. Um, I'm looking forward to working with everybody in any situation that ends up happening. But please, consider just giving it a little bit more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Angie. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Ami Johansson from Pierce Downer. So I actually wrote down what I wanted to say today. Um, so my name is Ami Johansson. I have, in the fall, I'm gonna have two kids at Pierce Downer, a kindergartner and a second grade um, student. And I wanna start by thanking Dr. Russell and the whole team for working so hard on this. Um, I was part of the remote task force group. I was on the, the remote side of it, but I know how hard you have worked. I've had conversations with many of you. For the last two years, my son has been three years actually, three, two, three years, my son has been in 58, I've worked with a lot of you. And I wanna start out by saying that the questions I'm posing here are not to discredit what you have done, they are just questions I have. All of you talk, of, well, Dr. Russell has talked about, many of you have talked about having the option of doing remote learning or the in-person um, option. But for many families, it's really not an option. I mean, in my head, I like to think I'd have the option of remote learning, but in reality, I know we are the first people to drop off at Champions and we are often the last people to pick up. Mm -hmm. And to find someone for that amount of care is probably out of our budget. Um, I, I actually, I love to dream that I could do it, but it, it's probably not gonna happen. So whatever plan you come up with is probably the plan we're gonna have to live with. So this is where I'm coming from. I just wanted you to know that. So, um, and as the weeks progress, I become more concerned with this plan. It has become increasingly concerning. So I'm a scientist, data is my friend, and Dr. Russell, the public health department, they have all these rules. There's not a whole lot of data behind it. 
Um, I have read the data, I've read those research papers, and all of it say, we don't know. There's a lot of we don't know. Even the six feet rule is a, a lot of, well, we think that's right. It is not in stone, it goes from three to six. It is, is all changing. So given that lack of data, um, I would like to know what this experiment, so this is an experiment we're doing with our kids, with our teachers, with our staff. So I would like to know what, um, when do we think the experiment has become too dangerous and failed? Like, do we have a cutoff? Um, and to get to this cutoff, will testing be available for students and staff without cost? Because if it costs money, lots of students and staff won't do it. And that's a problem. Um, Dr. Russell talked about you can get testing really quickly at sites. Well, social media now tells me seven to 10 days to get those results back. That's, not, that's even beyond the 14 days of self-quarantine. You're never gonna know, in, and that's gonna get worse as more people need to be get tested as we get schools up and going, as we get universities up and going. Um, will, um, so what is the iso isolation procedure for someone who you would suspect has it, but it is not confirmed. So they have symptoms, but you can't <coughs> confirm it because the testing is taking too long. And how are we gonna deal with that? Will parents be informed if a classmate tests positive or is suspected to have COVID-19 uh, because of symptoms? Does the district have a red line which we will go remote? Like enough students have been in quarantine, enough staff have been in quarantine. Hopefully no one actually is severely impacted to the leading death. I, I'm not even going there, but I'm talking about just being in quarantine. When's our red line that we all need to go remote? Because each of these districts in DuPage are doing different things. Um, I can give you at least three different plans I've heard of going on. And so I don't know how the public health department is gonna keep track of each individual district's plan. And we have 13 buildings in this district. So like, what's our goal as a district to when we say enough is enough uh, and we're going remote? Okay, so this we one's personal. Does All right, we're at two minutes, so about, if you wanna take about 15 more seconds to okay. wrap up. Okay, last thing, um, last thing I, I'll, I'll email this, the rest of this to you. Appreciate it. Last that. thing, um, the four, there have been at least four people who have taken off masks while talking. We are asking teachers to teach in a room full of students, probably without a mic, not taking off their mask. Mm -hmm. I did not like that, personally, that we can't even do what we're asking the teachers to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Last card, Andy Schmidt with the DGEEA. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Andy Schmidt, uh, DGEEA Vice President, also teacher at uh, Herrick. And um, I got to tell you, it's, it's great to be here and see everyone and you know, what, what we're doing here is, is um, really stressing the importance of face-to-face of -face, face -face interaction. And, um, you know, and we are not, you know, to, to what we are, are trying to do here, um, compromising anything. We have plastic partitions up. We're, we're wearing face masks. We're limiting attendees in, in the audience. So, um, you know, we're, we're modeling what we want to try to accomplish uh, in getting back to school. I just wanted to talk a, a, a couple, uh, I think Karat, you had talked about clusters. Before I get into kind of my statement, and this dovetails nicely, and we can try the best things, best scenarios, and sometimes, unfortunately, we know this, this is life, sometimes there's unintended consequences. And with the clustering and the modified uh, schedule of getting kids back you know one of the things we have to be real careful of is we have kids that have sp specialized um, curricular classes 
just like we have specialized you know across the board with with activities and whatnot you have classes like French and Spanish that are high school classes you have gifted LA at the middle school you have advanced math you have regular math so when we're talking about organizing clustering kids <coughs> we have to be very careful just one of the, the again potential consequences is that tracking of those kids that are in the high school Spanish foreign language uh, French class also because we have to make sure the French and Spanish teacher get to that class also those are the same ones that are going to have to have advanced math instruction might also be the same ones that have the gifted LA so we have one or two classrooms of again those those track kids I, I just wanted to mention that that that's something that just came up tonight when when you had mentioned that so <clears throat> You know, the way we communicate with parents and staff is always important. And during these challenging times, it's extremely crucial. And tonight with Craig and, and Emily and Angie speaking about the, um, the wording of the proposed motion for um, item 14B, I think it was. You know, I'm, I'm someone that can say, I've been there in your shoes I was on a, a board of education um, you know I was also one of those people that you know kind of knew Robert rules of order like the back of my hand and I was faced with decisions just like this tonight so actually I'm gonna kind of go off off topic here and a little bit different way of approaching it he had a similar situation where we had an issue with overcrowding in the school do we want to redistrict? Do we want to bring in portables? Which schools are we going to use the tracks as the division line to go to this middle school? And rather than setting a stake in the ground too early, because our administration, when I was on the board, needs that direction, just like Kevin and his team need the direction. They, they need to know where you are. And you know, sometimes you, you take votes, Andy, sometimes- 30 second, uh, just 30 second warning. Sometimes you can't take a vote but you can still give direction. And I, I think this is maybe one of those situations where you know, we could give, uh, you could give as, as a board direction and knowing that there are those options out there um, that we need to look at, that we need to roll up our sleeves. You saw there's a ton of work to do. There were hundreds of people listening tonight online. I was getting texts we can limit some of the noise and what people are going to see by our words and actions tonight as we move forward people are going to take away certain things that they want to they hear modified five-day plans we heard about families needing uh supervision and daycare you approve the plan five days there will be some families no doubt they'll say i'm done i have five days worth of coverage i don't have to worry about and that's not what we're saying we're saying this is an option, but you still have to give us time. You're going to have teachers that are going to see this and say, hey, I'm going to be teaching you know, outside under a tent, or you know, I'm going to be teaching outside my subject area. No, this is an option. We're going to look at all those things. So I just think maybe a, a different way of approaching it, too, to, to give the administration what they need to move forward with us tomorrow when we have a, a meeting plan to look at all these things tell them that yes it's on the table along with everything else rather than saying this and then in two weeks pivoting and coming back with another one no 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 all three options are on the table come to us in two weeks with your best option thank you thank you, thank you. we're going to take this time now that was the last card we're going to go ahead and take this time to read our statements that were posted online um, we do have 39 so, um, that were submitted remotely through the Google form. And Melissa, continue to watch my time, so if I'm, if I'm going over, you can let me know. Uh, the first one is from Dana Jablonski, uh, Henry Puffer parent. And, um, and oh, Dr. Russell, a, a lot of these, I, I was able to glance through these uh, quickly, and it looks like there may be a lot of questions, so I would just encourage, mm -hmm. uh, maybe take some notes, there might be some clarity that we wanna provide at the end here, but we will also, just the same as with everything else, uh, but I'm gonna give you an opportunity sort of at the end of public comment to, if there's any clarity you wanna put on the, kind of the whole round of 
uh, comments we've been getting. Uh, her comment tonight is, what are the plans for in-person learning regarding non-air conditioned classrooms and masks? Staff, students, particularly those with asthma and allergies will not be safe in these conditions in the fall and spring. Next up, we have uh, no name submitted here, but the comment said, I would like a response from the board on why they feel that students and faculty safe, safely share confined spaces, but the board and 28 others, which is worth uh, noting, could be the amount of students in a classroom feel the risk is too great and dangerous to the point where they will not attend. Kelly Miller uh, from O'Neill stated, first, I would like to say that I appreciate the work of Dr. Russell, the board, and the district teachers and staff navigating through these past few months. As a high school educator myself, these have been unprecedented times, and the leadership and honest communication has been top notch. I know that at this juncture, there is no perfect answer, and that this is an ever-changing process. With all that said, I would like to know if there is a plan in place for if a staff or student gets sick, and will the district be prepared to go into remote learning if it is called for. Next is Alexandra Lennart from the Highland District. If a full-time school stool is reinstated and social distancing is possible, can the students be put in such instructional groups that would allow them to remove masks throughout the day while receiving instruction? I do not believe that wearing a mask for seven hours long periods, five days a week, is feasible option for most young children. Next up, Alan Doherty from the Pierce Downer and Herrick District. If a teacher tests positive for COVID-19, are they required to qu uh, quarantine for 14 days? If that teacher has five classes a day with 20 students each, do all 100 of those students need to stay home and quarantine for 14 days? What if someone who lives in the same house as a teacher tests positive? Does that teacher now need to take 14 days to quarantine? Substitutes teach at multiple schools. What if they are diagnosed with COVID-19? Do all the kids in each school now have to quarantine and get tested? What if a student <coughs> in your children's class tests positive? What if that kid's uh, what if your kid tests positive? Uh, does every other student and teacher they have have to be quarantined? Do we all get notified who is infected and when? Or because of HIPAA regulations, are parents and teachers just going to get a may have been in contact with email? Thank you for your time. Tia Nash from the Highland area has stated, I am very impressed with the proud work from Dr. Russell and the entire remote learning committee and the leadership team. Stakeholders, including teachers, parents, administrators from all disciplines and backgrounds, thought through scenarios and posed relentless questions to cover as many contingencies and issues as possible. I am confident that both the safety and educational needs of our students are being addressed carefully and methodically. I wholeheartedly support Dr. Ruckles, Russell's recommendation to support individual face-to-face -face learning while also offering a robust remote learning choice to families who prefer to have their children learn from home. I, as a parent and a community member, recognize that I must also do my part in the coming months to make these unprecedented circumstances as successful as possible for both of my children and our whole community. Hello, uh, let's see where we Beth Krapivko from the Kingsley area. Hello, I have several questions, but I will try to narrow it down to a few. First, how will students be expected to sit in a hot classroom with no AC, and the rumor is fans won't be allowed, is that true, with a mask on? Does the district have any intention of postponing the start date of the year <coughs> to after Labor Day when temps are cooler? Second, if a student has an IEP or a 504 plan and possibly exempt from wearing a mask, how will we keep all our teachers and students safe? Lastly, what is the procedure for when and if a student or teacher is exposed to COVID or test positive? Amy Eide from the Whittier District. Um, actually left a public comment that just says none, so. Luke Hendrickson 
from the Pierce Downer and Herrick District. Questions on the agenda. One, it says that plans um, to sell seven kilns. Are these kilns being replaced with new kilns? Have the art teachers been asked if they want to use the kilns for their curriculum? Don't the art teachers use their kilns? Bel Air, Leicester, Hillcrest, PD, Highland, Indian Trail, and El Sierra for sure use their kilns. Also in K through eight art, while pottery play may not be specifically stated standard, I thought that the schools taught differentiation where kids could ex uh, I thought that the, the schools taught differentiation where kids could excel in other areas besides just drawing and painting. Would this be helping the social emotional well-being of each student? Shouldn't District 58 be trying to educate the whole student, not just for math and science? Thinking about 3D art is different than 2D, and some kids excel in 3D and not 2D art. There is, other, there is no other solution in pottery clay as it is so much different than model magic and self-drying clay. Number two. Does District 58 have a backup plan for remote learning? For instance, some districts have spent the summer creating an enhanced e-learning where there are recorded instruction. And will there be small group instruction at schools or online? How are students being broken up into classes? Will IEP and 504 be considered? How will teachers differentiate learning if a teacher is only teaching from the front of the class? Will kids be split up by ability level then? How does this work? Will students have teachers with the correct licensure teaching? What happens if teachers get COVID? How do we keep everyone safe? Will this plan be for school year, be for the, all the school year? Will kids be in one classroom only all day? Fanny Vallejos is in the Highland District. Good evening, first thank you for your dedication during this unprecedented times. I, can e I can't even fathom <coughs> how difficult it has been to maneuver and make sure consequential decisions amidst these conversation, uh, circumstances in order to placate everyone, which by the way will never happen. On to my questions. One, how will the gifted program be affected by the current guidelines and the restrictions in place? Will students still be boarding a bus and commuting to Pierce Downer one day a week or is this no longer feasible? If the students will be still be commuting to another school, how will the activities and assignments change, if at all, if they were meant to, to be collaborative efforts between peers? Two, even though I'm sure this is one of the main questions throughout our community and one that you're addressing tonight, I'll ask anyway, will parents have the option to choose remote learning in lieu of in-person instruction? If so, what does that remote learning look like within the gifted program? You are most definitely not in an enviable position, so thank you so much for your time and consideration. Brooks Rule from <coughs> Fairmount and O'Neill. I did not see any recommendation for ventilation protocols in the Health and Safety Task Force recommendations for fall reentry. Has there, has there been or will there be any considerations to improve the classroom and overall in-school space ventilation? This is a major concern of mine given that the reported risks associated with enclosed spaces how do we get ventilation protocols added to the fall re-entry? Janine Smith of Hillcrest, Indian Trail, and O'Neill has stated, as a parent, I am concerned about how students and teachers can go back to school. I need to know how safe is this proposed plan for teachers, staff, and students. Will custodians be cleaning extra in order to keep everything safe? What happens if a teacher has COVID and has long-lasting bad effects? While this might not happen for students, we will need to be concerned for all of our teachers and staff. How will teachers teach for all learners in a classroom? Will there be small group instruction? How are kids placed in homerooms? Is there an ability to level? Will my kids be able to be in more than one classroom? How long is this plan for? How will kids with an IEP 504 be taken into consideration? How is everyone going to grow and succeed? How will we plan for more than one plan? Lastly, since we have already have the lowest amount of art, PE, music in DuPage County, at, at a time when we need more music art, more than anything, because art and music are social emotional learning skills, why are we selling our kilns? Are the art teachers asked if they want to have a kiln and teach kids how to use clay properly and construct in 3D? Why should children have to wait to create in clay until seventh grade now to create in clay? Laura Hope from Herrick. Three comments <coughs> questions. 
One, assuming 58 implements on-site learning, I would like information on the procedure to address when a staff member or student is positive for COVID-19, contact tracing, notifications, etc. Two, we have more than one person at risk in the household. A return to school five days a week is not feasible. Will blended learning be available for a household like mine if the majority of students returns five days a week, or will remote learning be the other option? Looking to reduce risk by less in-person attendance. Number three, what scenario would impact District 58 to implement remote learning? Winlin. Win Lin Lin of the O'Neill uh, area. Uh, number one, what is your procedure to ensure that parents will be notified of any classes of positive COVID cases in the school as soon as possible to prevent lag time, which would cause spread of the virus? Two, how would you enforce the wearing of proper masks at all times during school hours, especially during gym or lunch hours, and when in the hallways between periods, and allow teachers to still have time to teach? I've seen many in public wear it underneath their noses. Fair amount. Um, Brian Acock. First, thank you to the school board and the district administration team for everything they have already done and will continue to do to ensure the safest experience possible for our children. The leadership shown by both bodies this year has been welcome and very well received. Tonight, I want to encourage the school board to push for a blended model for our fall return to school. This is a creative way to honor the commitment to students and families without risk associated with full return to in-person instruction. Options to decrease class size by 50% include using alternative half days or week on week off instruction. I am concerned that a full return to in-person instruction will lead to unnecessary spike in cases, which will put us back where we were in spring of last year. I strongly believe that a blended approach will allow us to ramp up the normalcy over the course of the year. I know this decision will weigh on each of you and, and any decision you make will bring a number of challenges, but I urge each of you to consider this model because it allows us to use the most flexibility to safely return while diminishing a risk to our children and the staff to, that dedicate their lives to education. Thank you, Brian and Samantha Acock. Allison Roselle of the Hillcrest <coughs> area. My name is Allison Roselle. My daughter attends Hillcrest. I'm advising the board and school district to keep the kilns to help students make types of lasting sculpture that they can otherwise could not make. Sculpture often is, uh, is often a big component of middle school art. Elementary students love it too, and it seems that traveling art teachers make use of the kilns. Sculpting a functional art object out of clay, as my son did at O'Neill, is also a way to incorporate s steam. Clay does not need to be shared like many other art supplies. It can be portioned out to each student during a time when they are minimizing student contact. Some students who do not like two-dimensional art make uh, art making love clay. It is building. Will any school keep a kiln? Obtaining a new kiln costs around $3,000, and we are getting rid of functioning equipment. What is the problem with keeping kilns even if adaptations need to be made? They can be used once the surrounding areas are up to code, as I thought they were like, likely were already in buildings like O'Neill, where they are used often. Please explain your rationale at each building in full. Uh, next up, does not have a name, but they are in the Pierce Downer district. What if a student in your kid's class tests positive? What if, test, what if your kid tests positive? Does every other student and teacher have to be quarantined? Do we all get notified of who is infected and when? Or because of HIPAA regulations, are parents and teachers not going, uh, are going to get that mysterious? Have you been in contact email? Um, okay. Kendall Grant from Henry Puffer and Kingsley has, uh, has sent a note in here, plan for when someone tests positive for COVID. Can we choose to do e-learning instead of in person? Can we change our choice during the year? E-learning plans for students with IEPs. Thank you. We appreciate the efforts in this difficult time. We have a parent from Kingsley, Noel Schwartz. <clears throat> what is the plan for a teacher or student who tests positive? Parent from Whittier, Rebecca Aldman. Can you please review the plan for kids in junior high? who have an IEP. 
Kelly Hess from Pierce and Herrick. As a parent, I appreciate the hard work of the board and staff is going <coughs> to come to find a solution for the upcoming school year. At the same time, I am concerned as a parent for my children, all students, and all teachers. I am hopeful we can come together as a school community to have the safest route for everyone. When I read through the email last week, I have become more worried. How will teachers teach to all students? Will students have a small group instruction? How will teachers be able to differentiate their instruction? How long is the plan for? One trimester, two trimesters, or the entire school year? As a parent, I would like to know this. Are students grouped in their homeroom by their ability level or map scores? Will students be in more than one classroom all day? Do we have a block? Uh, do we have a backup plan in case we are remote? If kids get the illness, do uh, but if kids do not get the illness, but teachers do. How will that work? How are IEP and 504 plans taken into consideration? Over the next five weeks or so, please work hard to come up with the safest plan for all students and staff can grow. Last February, a parent mentioned mentioned in the curriculum meeting that art and music are social emotional learning curriculums and how we didn't need another SEL program. It appears with COVID time, we need art, PE, music now more than ever. How can we add more art, music, and PE time to our kids' schedule so that we are healing kids? It seems that this would be a good time to keep kilns so that all children have the opportunity to create and find success in class so that they can continue to have other opportunities to, to excel in. While there currently isn't any specific art media listed in the Illinois Art Standards, but to create one and two do state, but to create one and two do state that students should create and experiment using a variety of materials to express. Why wouldn't we still offer clay for our students? I am with hope there will be consideration to enhance art, music, and PE programs and talk to our teachers to see what their curriculum plans are instead of dwindle these programs down. Please do not vote for getting rid of the kilns for our art teachers. Catherine LaCrosse from Highland. Thank you to everyone for all of your hard work on returning our children to school safely. Are there any provisions for children who will not or cannot wear a mask, specifically preschool children and those with IEP and sensory issues? Another one with no name or school just says students do not sit in their desks at many schools. There are tables. What are new desks? When are new desks being purchased? Cost, budgetary concerns. Will the desks also have partitions like the board has displayed? Lisa Barajamovic from the Bel Air District. Would the extend program still be offered and how would this work in this environment? Another one with no name or, dis or, or school zone. How can the district utilize the DG Library, Belmont Rec Center, Lincoln Center, admin buildings, etc., to allow for further distancing, even using the high schools if it is being stressed for kids 13 and under to be in person? Teresa Johnson from the Kingsley area. The agenda states the district will dispose of surplus equipment, which includes seven kilns. Will there be any operating kilns still in use in the school instruction returns to District 58? Please do not get rid of all kilns in District 58. Art is so important, and that includes use of a kiln. My child only had one art class that used a kiln because the pandemic wiped out his second chance to use it in eighth grade. I feel like art always is always considered one of the last priorities in the district, which still has to be least number of art minutes in all of DuPage County. Another one with no name or location. Parents of summer school students that use the Cellus do not feel this is a good tool. What other research-based options do we have to explore and will be presented to parents? Amanda Harrington from the Leicester District. Has anyone considered being given to using face shields as a substitute for masks. Um, the Hillcrest parent uh, did not leave their name. The presentation provided tonight indicated that special accommodations would be made for staff or students with specific medical certifications. Would those accommodations also apply to families where parents have specific medical cer certifications that are at risk from the contagion from their children? Fanny Vallejos, as I'm watching the presentation, I've come up with a couple more questions. 
How will the district deal with students or staff who refuse to wear a mask, not exempt for medical reason? What is the policy for enforcement or recourse? Also, what will the visitor policy look like? Kendall Grant, uh, can you please explain the Excellus online pretty, uh, learning program? Is there, is this the only option available for families to choose to do e-learning? What does that program look like, especially for younger learners, pre-K and K? Does this mean they would not have contact with their regular classroom teachers or classmates? Christopher Hanley from the Herrick area. Are buses shared with other school districts that have different standards for student distancing during a day period where during a day period where bus disinfecting may not be possible? Samantha Figueroa from the Lester area. Can the district utilize classroom space at Longfellow if necessary or explore using mobile or temporary classrooms? Michelle Sloboda in the Henry Puffer area. I'm a parent of two children with asthma. I am also a teacher myself. I am feeling that the blended instruction and afternoon instruction lunch at home is the best model. Uh, she gave us a link to a WGN news article. Although this may not be popular opinion in DuPage County school boards and administrators, but I feel that this is the safest option. This offers students to be in person each day, but also offers students social distancing. There are many concerns I have as far as the school days goes. First, all students and staff must be required to wear a mask at all times. If one does not, it poses a risk to others, especially those who are at high risk for complications with COVID. Also, I think temperature checks should be checked by school employee before children step onto a bus and before they exit cars. We cannot wait until they get into the building or at doors of the buildings. We also need to think about um, personnel who, who are required to clean the spaces. Think about Roundup and health concerns it can cause cancer, liver, kidney damage, etc. What is expected to use who? what is expected to use the cleaning products to kill COVID and what PPE will be given to those individuals to keep them safe? I also worry about social distancing in the classrooms. Is it truly possible? Are the children able to socially distance six feet apart? What about ventilation? Also, many schools do not have air conditioning. Children will be required to wear a mask during very warm days in the fall and the spring. We have considered air conditioning and ventilation system. Have you considered air conditioning and ventilation system? How is staff feeling about the return to the school plan? Are they feeling safe and supported? Are teachers are the ones in the front line who are putting themselves and their families at risk? If they are not feeling safe and supported, this is unfair to them. I do not want teachers feeling as though they are thrown in without regard. I do not know how students and staff can return with the CDC guidelines in place. Six feet should always be impl implemented. If not, we should not be returning to school. The AAP has retracted their earlier statement about kids returning to school. I hope we are considering their new views. No name or attendance area here. Will students, if Excellus program is used for remote instruction based on parental choice to stay at home, be paired with their assigned classroom teacher or a stranger outside the district or grade level? Thank you. Just a few more. Katie Thomas of El Sierra. With mounting evidence suggesting COVID-19's airborne spread, what precautions are being made for our two open concept schools in terms of air circulation with no windows to open has the district looked into airflow in those buildings in the same regard to concerns about airborne transmission at all buildings when students need to take off their masks for an extended amount of time to eat lunch how can we do that safely even with masks being put on again after lunch is it safe for students and staff mark thomas from the el sierra area what will District 58's policy be in terms of notifying families of COVID cases at their schools? Furthermore, what is the action plan for when a child feels unwell during the school day with the potential for COVID symptoms, in particular in terms of safe quarantine of students until they are picked up um, and the procedure for them to return to school? Joanne Vaught at Henry Puffer and Herrick. Why is the middle school being lumped in with the grade schools? Is a different schedule for middle school even being considered? Herrick is cramped and crowded as it is. I am very concerned how social distancing will be addressed at this level. Kelly Fallen Wilson, or Fallon Wilson. 
uh, in Hillcrest. I want to start by thanking Dr. Russell, Mr. Sissel, the task force, and all others involved for the work that has been done thus far in addressing learning options for 2020 through 2021. However, I am concerned that with the start of school only six weeks away and no firm plan really in sight, we are again leaving our educators with very little time to plan for whatever learning model or models will, will look like in the fall. Additionally, though the time is short, I hope before our model <coughs> is agreed upon and the public is given more than 60 minutes to provide comment and a live Q&A is permitted with Dr. Russell. Finally, I think we should all keep in mind that we are not trying to create a model for learning to last for a lifetime for our children. We are, ideally, looking at only one school year, perhaps two, I hope not. I implore those making these decisions to keep that in mind. I know all families are struggling and I will continue to struggle regardless of the model that is chosen. But rushing our kids back to school when their physical health and safety and that of their teachers and administrators is at risk is misguided. It seems inevitable that even if we press forward with a five day a week on-site learning plan, we will be right back to remote learning within just a few weeks due to the inevitable spread of the virus. I appreciate your consideration of these comments and again, thank you for all of your hard work. Our final online submitted comment is from Kelly Janzus Janzusko in the Bel Air area. Thank you for all your time. I do not envy your position. You are all in. My question is for Bel Air and El Sierra Schools, since both are open concept. Does that have any ramifications in regards to the amount of the kids in particular spaces? If someone is exposed, would the whole school have to be notified of potential quarantine since the exposure is potentially greater? Also, since we do both have AC, um, had the ventilation system been looked at for a potential HIPAA fil HEPA filters upgrade? Thank you for your time. That is the last of our online questions uh, our, and comments. I didn't know, some of those already got a little bit clarified and a significant number of these questions are gonna be coming in sort of that next phase. But uh, in case there was anything that you wanted to take a moment and provide clarity on, I did wanna make sure I gave you that opportunity. The only thing that I'd like to provide clarity on this time, because I, I want to be careful that we're not picking and choosing comments to respond to. We will get back to everyone either through a Q&A or individual comments. I want to be careful that we don't give one person's comments, you know, a, a greater standing than others. Um, number one, um, LCR and Bel Air, I have asked specifically that question with the county health department in terms of is the whole school one space or can you break it up <coughs> into the learning units like we've done right now? And I have gotten clarification from the health department that LCR does not count as one space for the entire school building. In fact, you can break that up into the current uh, learning units uh, that they have. So that is just one thing that I want to clear. So as we're looking at our plans for individual schools, LCR counts the same as our other schools and so does Bel Air uh, when we're looking to that plan. In terms of air conditioning, here you see kind of the catch-22 that we're in, uh, like some school districts where uh, on one side we have people d demanding air conditioning on the other side they're, they're saying well we have air conditioning in our school and, and, and that's problematic again one of the things that we will continue to stress is the influx of fresh air into our buildings whether that is through open windows or whether that is through our HVAC system to make sure that we continue to get that fresh air uh, into our building notification is another big thing um, throughout this and, and, and then we'll, we'll address the rest in the Q&A in terms of notification, I would encourage everyone to read uh, what is posted on the Illinois State Board of Education's website. They have a great FAQ that talks about what if someone gets sick, how do you handle that procedure? In terms of notification, we will continue to work with our health department. I would urge our parents to think back to the spring, how serious we take notification. We work exact or we work with the health department on how to notify, when to notify. Uh, we will never try and hide anything or not be transparent. We take notification very seriously and we will follow the direction of the county health department who is in charge of notifying individuals in the county um, should it be necessary. I do anticipate they will be putting out another FAQ on their own. Additionally, so will we as a school district that will help uh, our, our, our family. So um, I know there's a lot, but again, a lot of the questions that were raised this evening are already available in ISBE's FAQ. I will work with uh, Melissa to post <coughs> this on the agenda for this evening along with the guidance again. I think it would be helpful if people can go back and, and look at that information. Um, so we will get that posted on board docs. 
I want to also thank everyone for their civility in their comments this evening. That's much appreciated as the uh, superintendent. So thank you. Thank you. Melissa, are we wrapped up on time or do we have some time left? Our time is up. Okay. All right. Um, with that, we are going to move forward. Is there any need for a member of the board to take a recess? You good? Okay. Uh, then the first thing up here is the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the June 8th, 2020 regular meeting as presented or amended? Or, I'm sorry, as presented. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes from the June 8, 2020 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the June 22, 2020 special meeting as presented or amended? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the minutes of the June 22nd, 2020 special meeting as presented. Uh, next up, we have our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report, the financial statements consisting of the list of bills, and the summary as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Is this blue note? For, you want to read that? Yeah. Please note that a revised personnel report has been attached since the agenda was published on Friday. The only change is that two support staff positions have been struck from the assignment list. Oh, with that note, is there any dis further discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, we have several uh, items up for recommendation today. The first one is the board policy manual. Is there a motion to approve the board policy manual as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? <laughs> just to go Again, ahead. just wanted to say woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> just to get this clarity. This was a huge undertaking, and again, starting with Greg, um, when we jumped on board, he started uh, on the policy committee and started reviewing things. And this is a huge thing that um, we didn't even know we could do. And so thank you to Dr. Russell and the policy committee. Um, I think this is one of the best things in three and a half years that um, I have been involved in. So extremely proud and excited for that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I just had a question on, because this is a significantly no significant overhaul of mm -hmm. the district policies, uh, do we anticipate there to be any places where the policy has changed significantly from what the district had normally done or had previously done, where we would now be in conflict starting as soon as this vote happens? Yeah, that's a, a great question, one that I've received before. Um, I do not believe that, and, and the reason why I do not believe that is um, any unique policies that we had as District 58, whether that would be residency or um, you know home building or something like that, we made sure that we carried over. Um, tonight's tutoring policy is a great example of that, right? Now, now that's a little special case because ISB uh, left that off, and through our review, we made sure that we we, we caught that. Um, in terms of anything new that you would see in this policy manual that you didn't see in the other one, I think you will see a lot of things that you didn't see in the other one simply because this is now the Illinois Association of School Boards making sure that we have policies to line up with everything in school code. Um, I do not believe that there is anything quote unquote controversial that we would have uh, tackled as a school board. Having said that, um, there are always going to be things that um, perhaps you missed. And you always reserve the right as a Board of Education to quickly 
turn that around at the uh, the next meeting but yep. in general any of those special policies we would have carried over into the uh, the, the press manual um, but I would continue to encourage you to you know go over that with the fine tooth comb uh, one of the other highlights that I want to point out is that now our policy manual in no pun intended here is about 99 percent in line with district 99 right um, minus the, the high school policy so now you have almost a pre-k through 12 policy manual for the for the two districts so um, I, I don't believe that you're going to find anything that's uh, out of whack. Thanks for all the hard work there. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I do want to note that <clears throat> sort of the purpose of moving to this, this was not to create any policy level change. This was to sort of align with, with state law, get aligned with the new numbering scheme, which we were working towards anyway, and try to maintain that. The goal would be is after moving this and sort of getting the new language in that's required by law, if there's policy change that we want to make, that would be something that we wouldn't hide inside a massive document like that. That would be something that we would bring up through our policy committee and then have an opportunity to dialogue. So um, the, the, as I read through it, that's what I was kind of checking for is to kind of make sure that it, it, it stayed in line. And it, it, it seems like it has, um, and, and hopefully that if we need, feel the need to make any other changes, we would do those more directly um, as well. And the other thing, uh, just to, to piggyback, um, the new policy manual will have a search engine, and so I'd encourage board members to, you know, go ahead and do any searches. And if you would have a concern, you know, contact myself, member Weiner, or, or member Samanti, because then we could immediately address that with the policy committee or at the next meeting. Any other questions or comments? All right, then Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the board policy manual as presented. Next up is the recommendation for fall learning, the modified on-site instruction, five day days per week for all students and staff. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction, five days per week for all students and staff as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Um, any discussion? I'd, I'd like to uh, propose a couple modifications to this. Uh, one, uh, what we are actually giving uh, Dr. Russell and his team the permission to do here is explore the feasibility. And so I'd recommend that we change the language to move to approve the recommendation to explore the feasibility for fall learning under insert model uh, for all students and staff. And then the second modification I'd recommend is, uh, I, I really, I don't think that we're uh, um, pursuing uncharted territory here because over the last six to nine weeks, the state of Illinois has shown a lot of leadership across the country in how we've done closings and reopenings. Um, the state, uh, earlier than most, decided to shut down. Uh, we followed suit according to uh, uh, the recommendations that we were seeing in other parts of the economy we followed suit with our school district closing the day afterwards the district state announced their state closures uh, the reopening plans were I, if I had to call it anything I would call it gradual release first if any uh, restaurant retail and institution workplace uh, the way that we did reopening in those cases was first you did takeout or you ordered online and it got shipped to you um, you ordered over the phone and you were able to pick it up curbside then we started to put tent, tents up outside of establishments to to you know to take advantage of those services, and now we have modified on-site options where you can be at 25% or so capacity inside of workplaces or restaurants. Uh, that just shows a playbook for what to, what does it look like to do gradual release. Um, I, I don't see why a, a public school district should be an exception to that, and so. Uh, I also recognize the complexity of what we're asking our teachers, our staff, our administration, and our families to do, where there is a time in August, a day where nobody will be in buildings, nobody will be in schools, and the next day we're expecting everybody to show up and execute rather perfectly brand new norms and procedures. Uh, we don't expect that when we go into restaurants, that's why we went into curbside pickup and tents, to start to build our muscle for what that can look like. Um, I believe that our students should return back to school. Uh, I believe our students should return back to school safely. 
And I don't think anybody in this room or listening disagrees with that. The best way to do any sort of rollout is to phase it in, to give people the opportunity to build that muscle. And so what I'd recommend is exploring, approving the exploration of a feasibility, but not of the modified onsite, but of exploring the feasibility of, blended, uh, of the blended model. Uh, and the uh, last reason that I'll, uh, I'll say I'm in support of that one is uh, it gives us the best option and opportunity to ask the working groups to say, instead of exploring three different paths, you all are, are all part of exploring this one plan as a district, which is to explore the hybrid reopening, which also means that we have to explore the chance we have to go backward and go to remote and the ability to go back up if things are looking good to go to full on site or modified full on site. Uh, that makes everybody part of one team, in my opinion, as opposed to three parallel potential paths that have to be explored almost independently. Um, and so uh, for those reasons and many more that I won't get into for the sake of time, uh, I recommend modifying it to include pursuing the feasibility of and blended instruction. I, I do want to take an opportunity to uh, respond in that um, the purpose of us meeting here today and putting this on here is not asking somebody to explore the feasibility. It's for us to give guidance based on the information that we just received from, from the state and from our superintendent and the administration on what we feel would be the best foot forward and what our goal, we are not asking them to, to just test the feasibility, but we are asking them to try to solve a problem based on a goal that we are setting forward here. It is why the, the language is worded that way. That does not mean that if we find this to be not feasible that we don't move another route. But the, the feasibility exploration was being done with the state and with our administration. And I think moving into that direction doesn't set the goal forward. We have a very short window of time as we've addressed. We need to meet later on towards the end of this month. And we sort of need all hands on deck from our three bargaining units to sit down together and try to solve this problem. This is, n this is not sort of a fact-finding miss mission as, as much as it is that moment in Apollo 13 where they're sitting and trying to build that ventilation system. Um, the other part I would focus on is, as well is that I don't think we are looking at this as an independent, for independent methods, but as Justin referred to earlier, a, like a continuum of, of methods for teaching that one of the most important parts I think that we have to have going forward is not only these four plans, but what a transition looks like. In a transition, are we saving a couple of our five days that we have for, for, uh, you know, for teacher in-service in days and planning days so that we can use that to trigger? Are we going to have a, a smooth trigger built into place? But we know that we have to have a trigger plan in place as we move forward. Um, so I, I did want to take an opportunity to, to respond to that, but I think that this, this recommendation um, exploring is a big part of it, but it goes beyond that and it goes to our recommendation on the direction that we would like to see us find success in, in this district. So, but I will so, see the floor. So just to be clear, the recommendation is to it's on the slide is to pursue the feasibility of having the students and dr. Russell's already said that they that they are going to work with these groups and see if we can make this happen so by us voting tonight on this it is not a vote saying boom it's happening this is a vote right am mm -hmm. I correct saying yes. we're gonna get together with the custodians the support staff and the teachers and see if we can and principals pardon me uh, and see if we can make this work and then we're going to come back in two weeks or whatever right and you're going to say yes it's a go or you're going to say you know what upon further review this is not that we we've decided this so right. by doing this today that does not is that am i reading that correctly we are not locked stop having to people to are really forward. stuck and um, focused on this being a vote because normally like we're voting on like selling a truck or we're voting on this and so I think people are really really focusing on the fact that we're having a vote here and that's not like it's a directional vote like hey go it look is. at it but that's not a done deal it's am, not I, a am done I incorrect deal. no you're, you're absolutely correct and I think what's important here 
is noting that our goal is to say we're giving guidance and direction that based on the analysis that they've done in this in their what I would call a feasibility study they know technically now they can blueprint it on paper that does not mean that the moment you try to execute that it is actually feasible so but our, our goal is to get these these group is to is to put ourselves in the line and say that this is a goal of our district and they're asking for our the reason why they worded it this way is they're asking for our guidance that if it's possible that this is the direction we want to go because it is a tremendous amount of work for our bodies and they're asking us because they're they're stating they're you know they're they're kind of standing on their ground saying we recommend this and they're looking for us to say that um, if possible we can then, then we can support it and I think it's a it's a powerful statement asking us to stand behind the decision we're making not just asking them to go and and, and check a feasibility right. of it so that's my question is what is the difference between us talking about it which we did at length and have mm -hmm. for many days and a week um, and asking on a consensus to go forward with that versus actually having a vote, which is what we usually don't do. I think this is an opportunity for the seven of us to be on the record to give. Uh, but we so usually do that anyway on the record. Yeah. I mean, but it's different. This is a official roll call vote, I think is what was asked for at this point, but I, I can cede the floor to, mm -hmm. to you as well. Yeah, so I think this is one of those times where we all are saying the same thing, but, but, but hanging up on a word or two. Um, very much in, in, in I will own the agenda item because I'm the one who wrote it the, the way it was asking for board approval. It certainly wasn't to confuse anyone or to give an inclination out to the community that we had made a decision and that we didn't care what anyone said and we didn't want to hear from our employees. That is certainly not, not the case at all. I'm going to go back to the, the reason why we put it that way and I, I just want to read from everyone exactly what the guidance is telling us to do because Again, I, I got to keep going back to the subjective criteria. Right. Schools and districts are encouraged to provide completely in-person instruction for all students in phase four, provided that the school is able to comply with the capacity limits and implement social distancing measures, okay? The next thing says Public Act 101-0643 requires that school districts adopt a remote and blended remote learning day plan approved by the district superintendent. Um, the next paragraph says we recognize the impact COVID-19 has had on each aspect of our education system and the great potential for the crisis to deepen inequities students face. Therefore, we recommend that schools and districts create a diverse transition planning team in preparation for a return to in-person instruction under IDPH approved guidance. So what I'm, I'm suggesting here is that you allow the administration to move forward with an on-site instruction plan, but at the same time, the guidance is telling us we still have to create all of these other plans. We have to work with our transition teams to make sure that it can work, and if it can't, you default back to one of those other options. At the two-week window when we come back for a special meeting, that's exactly what we intend to do, is to say, we sat down with all of our associations, here's what we're thinking, here are the concerns, here are the pros and cons, we still think that this is the way to move forward or there's insurmountable obstacles here that we can't get over. Um, we could also come back in two weeks and say, we looked at this, but you know what, at the elementary school, it can work. At the middle school, there's too many things and we might need to do something different there. So uh, again, I think we're all saying the same thing, but I think people are getting stuck on the finality of this. And, and what I'm suggesting here is this guidance really doesn't allow you to have any finality because you could constantly be changing it. But, but we've got to move forward in terms of what the guidance says. So I hope that's making sense and provide some clarity. I, I understand. I, as, as, a, as an active member of the community and of the district before um, being on the board last year and sitting in the audience and watching things, I, I am over the top effusive trying to make sure yeah. that people understand because I've sat on the other side and said this is a done deal like mm -hmm. what that's not what's happening here and i i don't even know how many times i could say that to people oh, yeah. with with to convince them and so that's why i i just i just want to make sure that we are clear yeah. and that I, I i believe we are all on the same page with that and i'm tell me when in two weeks i'll come back 
I'm ready. But Melissa, I do have a request to make uh, that I need to get approval from the board on if they want to make a, a, an adjustment to um, adjust the language to exploring the feasibility of the hybrid plan as opposed to uh, the recommendation for the fall learning of a modified on-site five-day week plan. Am I getting your words correct? Except for hybrid, it'll be blended just to be consistent blend, with the I'm presentation. Sorry, yeah, so, um, can I get language on how to? Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I not, I'm not following why we're making that, that revision. He, he's requested yeah. to make a revision. Okay. He's got to call it's, it's it to a request. vote okay. to see All if right. we want to make that revision, and yep. then we can go ahead and. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, you need to make a motion to amend the language, and Which then. I, I believe he did. So do you want to make an official. So we need a second. Yeah. Right. So right now, um, what, why don't you motion exactly how you'd like that worded so that we have it for the record? Yeah. Let me just uh, make one point around the why. Uh, the fixed. Uh, anytime there's uncertainty, which is the definition of the year or the word of the year, um, uh, you try to reduce as much of your fixed cost as possible, knowing that there's probably going to have to be changes. Uh, the amount of fixed cost changes that we would have to make in the modified onsite is potentially different teaching relationships between student and teacher because you have to reallocate uh, certified staff to different classrooms. Uh, those relationships are hard to build at a minimum, but also really difficult to shift. Uh, in, a blend, in a blended approach, you can largely conduct your school day as expected, maintain those relationships so you have the opportunity to continue to go up or down. So that fixed cost, largely, I, I, largely, I don't want to say completely because of Justin's point earlier, gets reduced. Um, relocating students to other schools. That is a large fixed cost for families and for those students who are not used to the, these new buildings um, or the teachers in those buildings. Uh, you re remove that fixed cost by doing a blended model. Um, teachers teaching subjects, I, I, I can't even emphasize how big of a difference that would be. If you've taught a particular subject or a particular grade level or a particular special area, to reallocate that fixed cost to teach something different I mean, that takes, in some cases, years. If you think about first year of teaching, that's a really big hill to climb. Um, we would eliminate that fixed cost by doing the blended model. Uh, building muscle in a district about what it means to wear face masks all day. Doing that two days a week to get started and get our feet wet and figure out what it is as a third grader, as a kindergartner, or whatever it might be, gives us that chance. And so for that and a number of other reasons, the motion that I'd make is that we change the language of this action item because I do think it's important to give clarity to the community um, that we are exploring the feasibility of the blended instructional model uh, and that we would come back to th the board with a plan to be approved for the vote. So just to kind of clarify, you're we saying... Two different. Yeah, so we would have two different votes. No, it, well, we'd vote now to either... Um, to, well, we need a second, but... He's motioning to change our, right now the, the motion on the table is to approve the recommendation for fall learning for a modified on-site five day per week for all students and staff. He is, uh, uh, Member Doshi is, is recommending, uh, or motioning to make a change to that to um, update that action item to explore the feasibility of a blended learning model. Um, for all students and staff. Um, and all we would be voting on, the, all, we, all you would second to that is, can we have a vote to change that language? Then we would vote on that actually being the recommendation and guidance we give the administration. That would then change the recommendation if, if that were to pass. We even talk about yeah, so, so when would the discussion, because I have questions before yes. we vote on so that. So you need to vote on the motion, the right. amendment. The motion to amend, and then you can okay. discuss. So I have a motion on the floor okay. to, a, to adjust action item B of uh, to approve the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff to be changed to approve to explore the feasibility of a blended learning model for students and staff. Second. Okay. Discussion. Um. 
So I think it's how you interpret things, and I'm just going to interpret things differently mm -hmm. and explain why I would say no and go with the modified on uh, learning. The reason why we did a step on restaurants was for money, so that these individual businesses would not go out and completely trash the economy. And again, this is my interpretation. Um, the blended model, especially for the younger kids, based on the fact that every day is different, actually causes, back to Psych 100, would cause more confusion and would cause them to not actually retain information as far as even wearing masks. It also would allow kids and to be in different areas. I feel like if, the, if our students are in one place, for the majority of the day, that's how we keep them safe. That is how we mitigate, that is how we can control their environment. If we have blended days and they are going off to daycare or they are going off to grandparents or they're going, that actually brings in way too many things. Um, and I'm not even just talking about the, the general whatever. So I'm interpreting things very differently, um, but I do not agree with. We had enough families saying that um, leaving a half an hour early on a Monday was going to cause great family chaos as far as logistics. And now we're asking families to have one week on, one week off, two days on, getting off at this time, one day of remote. There's gonna be no consistency throughout the schools as far as the remote learning because different people that are teaching different things. So right away we lose equity. It goes completely out the window. Um, so I would vote no on um, the blended. I um, haven't really shared my views too much tonight, but I have talked a lot over the past couple of weeks, um, or researched a lot and thought a lot and read a lot. Um, I am very concerned about the five-day in-person model um, for a lot of reasons. I think given our uh, large class sizes, overcrowded schools. I think it's going to be very, very challenging, if not impossible, to um, accommodate six foot social distancing in all of our schools. I think it might be possible in some of our schools, but I think there are going to be some that are going to be extremely challenging. We have a large number of class sections that are above 19, like a very large number. And to both find space in our schools for those and staff to fill those positions of, of educating those children, I think it's going to be near impossible. Um, I'm very concerned about that. Even if we are able to achieve that, I'm very, very concerned just in the nature of a school that even if you can have the desks six feet apart, you're not going to keep the kids six feet apart. And you're not going to keep the teachers away from the kids at all times and they're not going to keep their masks on. And it's just, I think that there, it's very, very risky. I think, um, we're talking about kind of taking the most aggressive approach. You know, Crap talked about um, when we opened other aspects of the economy, we opened them slowly and we opened them in phases. And we're talking about taking the most aggressive approach right out of the gate. And I think in this situation, a, a more cautious approach is warranted. I think we've seen in examples across the country where states who've opened aggressively have seen drastic rises in cases, spikes, um, and things like that and I just think do we experiment with the lives of our children and our staff in that way I, I, I don't know if the risk is worth the reward um, I'm very concerned about that I'm very concerned for um, our staff and being able to just keep everybody safe I think that um, Jill I understand your point about the um, day-to-day -day change and shift in kids if we did a blended approach, but I've also read information that talks about um, abrupt shifts in um, scenarios for kids, like going from full-time in school to full-time remote can be very extremely disruptive to a kid's social emotional as well. And if they have some experience with remote and some experience within school, all at the same time, you know, all kind of happening simultaneously, that could be less disruptive if all of a sudden we do have to go back to remote or we do go to full in school. So I think that's there's there's some other research out there to show that there's there's other thoughts on that. Um, I do agree with Karat's 
idea that um, kind of building our muscle and building the students' muscles in particular in terms of um, spending time working on remote learning, spending time working on in-the-classroom learning will give us more flexibility. You know, Kevin, you stated, you, you talked a couple times about how the guidelines are, are a constant moving target and they keep changing them. They changed them like a couple days ago. So I think a blended approach would give us more flexibility and agility to meet those guidelines as they continue to shift because we will have experience with blended or experience in the classroom and experience with remote. And I just think minimizing the numbers of kids we have all together in a building is safer. And I, I'm i apprehensive. Uh, I don't know. That's kind of and I am not saying to throw everyone back into the school. Obviously, there are um, my other reasons for that. I guess I'm just a little frustrated because I think we were getting ready to vote on something and we just spent an hour and 45 minutes where we could have discussed all the blended model, which we did not at that time. So um, I feel like we are no closer to providing staff tomorrow in an hour when it is, or two hours when it is going to be tomorrow, um, any closer to what we are asking them to do. Well, I so think I think we need to figure that out um, just because we need to yeah, that is I, I guess a, Jill, as a board, this Jill, is what we need to be doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo your frustration, um, but I also extremely value member uh, Doshi's oh, uh, perspective. Um, so I guess, you know, I'll kind of share my perspective. The gradual release, I, I think that's spot on, right? Like, I, I, I see value in that. But I think if I look at being a resident of Illinois, they've kind of established that um, gradual release for us, right, through the phase model, right? So we're, we're talking about phase four in this situation. Mm -hmm. And then phase four says you still need to abide by all the Illinois um, health requirements. As Dr. Russell's kind of read, I think, twice. Hopefully we don't have to read it a third time, but it was actually in my notes, so um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll stop from doing that. Um, I, you know, the, the challenges, Emily, that you mentioned, I think, um, you know, I trust Dr. Russell. He's coming to us tonight, um, putting himself out there to say, hey, I think me and my team can overcome these challenges. So I, I fully support him in, in kind of hashing out what that feasibility looks like to address those challenges. Um, Jill, I think your, your comments on social emotional um, um, challenges, um, kind of shifting our kids um, one way um, to the next uh, over and over again, I, I, think, you know, I think that's spot on from my um, personal perspective. Costs, Karad, I think that's, that's great that you bring that up. Um, you know, to be honest, um, even being on the FAC, this isn't top of mind cost in this discussion. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's that's at the bottom of the list in terms of priority. Um, so I'm not, I, I, I'm not I, sure what you mean by what do you mean by cost? Just to make sure you and I are clear on it. Because you, you mentioned um, cost, fixed costs being a consideration. In the, the fixed the costs are, are relationships. I'm not monetizing that. I'm saying that it's hard for a third section of third grade to build a relationship with a PE teacher and then shift to another classroom because we go back to modified on-site as we see the numbers continue to decline those relationships are hard to uh, strike and then also hard to pivot that's a fixed cost the PE teacher just putting that as an example learning what it is like to lead a third grade classroom and that curriculum is a fixed cost we'd be asking a lot a lot of our staff and our families none of that is being monetized okay so I, I guess I'm a clear no before we vote. I'll, I'll throw that out there. Uh, the idea of, of changing the motion is, is not something I can support. And, and the reason being is uh, I'm, I'm looking at the recommendations that are coming down from ISBE and, um, and then the very tight leash that the DuPage County Health Department really seems, I mean, they've taken an incredibly conservative approach, even if you compare it to the other county health departments. I'm looking at this option and I think that as a goal, we should have set forward to try to meet the standards set out by the Illinois State Board of Education. Uh, and this motion does that. It gives our guidance to uh, not only Dr. Russell and his staff, but our principals, our leaders, our, our union staff. Um, and so that we can get these groups together to build a plan that works. The idea that we would pull back right now against the recommendation of the state and jump straight to a blended plan, um, seems like we would be p holding ourselves short from a lot of the conversations I've had. You know, I, I know there, there's already a lot of people in daycare situations and, and stuff like that. So 
I, I look at this as actually expanding the um, uh, amount of reach that, that, these, that these children have with, with other people and seeing if we can keep that in a more controlled environment. Uh, I am excited by the idea that this is technically possible. I also share some concerns that logistically it, it may not actually pan out. And that's why um, we're sort of giving our guidance, we're giving our guidance to move down this path, but we're gonna have to have a meeting later on this month. I don't think we're at a place where we can stamp this and say we're ready to go for August. And um, look, I, I have two kids in this district. My wife is a teacher. And I, I, ha I had to ask myself, I had a long talk with my wife who's being asked to come back to school in the, in the fall to teach. Looks a little bit different, she's a high school teacher, but uh, nevertheless, uh, she's gonna be seeing a lot of you know, uh, different classes come through her, her room. And we've had a long talk about it and it's something that I've determined I can be comfortable with from that perspective and from my, you know, my children. I think that, that we're making a plan that's trying to take all of these pieces into account and weigh it and, and, and try to do what's best by, by the children in our district. So I want to support the original um, recommendation, but uh, before I, we go to I'm, 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 still, I'm still confused because Dr. Russell said, it sounds like we're on it. So if we're pursuing the feasibility of having the students come this back. Is, but this is to a blended model. So he wants to change it to make to, to shift it. Now it's not a now. That's Expl not what you're saying. Though. Explore the feasibility of returning to in a blended model. You're for just all saying blended only to abort the five day. I think uh, really what I'd like to see the plan look like ultimately in two weeks is we open up in a blended model so we can start to build our muscle as a district, not ask for significant new fixed costs to be paid, figurative dollars, not yeah, real no, dollars. I, I guess I'm I'm still. Sh sh um, since you, you uh, responded to me incorrectly um, interpreting your comments, can you just define fixed costs in relationship to you? Um, if you're teaching a new section of third grade, uh, because we have to create that under the modified onsite to get to the 14 to 19 students in a room, that's a new set of 14 teacher to student relationships that have to be created and a new set of learning for that new teacher that had not planned to taught, teach third grade to learn how to teach third grade. And any first year teacher will tell you the first year was their hardest. And for us to ask them to do that fixed cost in what is a really uncertain time where it's possible that we're gonna have to change this plan again and again a few times, all, all I'm asking is that we plan for the scenario that gives us the lowest amount of fixed cost and allows us the biggest opportunity to build our muscle to pivot if we have to go to fully remote, we will know, every student will know what it looks like to do remote learning two days a week in the blended model. And if we go up to full on-site or modified on-site because the numbers are looking good, every student knows what these new protocols look like in school with masks and with six foot distance. But to be able to ask everyone to pay all this heavy fixed cost in an uncertain time, again, pay the fixed cost being figurative dollars, not real dollars, or figurative relationships or learning a new curriculum, uh, I think is presenting this idea of too much certainty in a time of uncertainty. But, but if you, if you to your point, if we're looking to um, shoot for the moon and we're gonna, and we're gonna, we're gonna see if we can attain the, what the goals by is VR, everything else will kind of, fall, in my opinion, like if you go, big and you try to see if it'll work then a blended model will be pretty i mean this is Relatively. this is it, it will be easier to ratchet it down as opposed to up in my opinion so i can't even presume to know what goes on in a classroom i've volunteered before but so that's why i feel like these working groups will be able to figure this out pretty pretty quick yeah and, and so like it will flush out this will all be flushed out, I believe, and your hybrid model will be flushed out by talking about a five day. It inherently, it will come out into conversation and it will naturally fall into place. Just to clarify, yeah. Kevin, we are writing, or we are designing to be able to handle being in any of the four scenarios. Yes, I, I, I wanna, again, highlight, I, I really do think 
hearing our association say and hearing the board, I, I think we're a lot closer than we are, you know, further apart. And, and what I mean by that is we have plans as an administrative team to work on what this modified on-site plan will look like, what a blended option will look like, and what a remote. We define remote differently, but, but in those three phases. We are going to look at each one of those. Um, now, why is, why did I ask the motion to be modified on site? Because again, that's what the guidance said. But we are not gonna ram something through before we get a chance to talk with our associations. We wanna meet with them, we wanna talk with them and make sure that it's feasible. If it's not, another group of staff members will be working with us on a hybrid model and what that could look like. One of the things I would throw out there is I always try and find a happy medium between what is being discussed. One of the things that the working groups can talk about is this gradual build up to an on-site plan. So it's not uncommon, and we've discussed this idea as well, to take a look at the first couple weeks of school and do you want to start off in more of a blended to get kids there and then transition into a fully remote after you've had time to, to build things, if you're able to, right? And, and so all of these fully things... Fully on site, I mean. What's that? You mean fully on site. Correct. I'm sorry if I misspoke. Um, so all of these things will be flushed out in, in, in the working groups here. Uh, so we, we've got the direction. What, what the intent of the language of the um, uh, motion was is to say to the administration, it's July 13th, see if you can implement this guidance. If you can't come back to us, then let us know and then tell us what, what, what the plan B is. But I'm suggesting to everyone here, we have a plan A, we have a plan B, we have a plan C. It's already defined in here, we're gonna be working on it. And in two weeks time, we're gonna come back after we consult with all of our associations, which is quite clear, we need to do that. And that's exactly what we're gonna do and then we'll come back. I think one, one um, concern I have with that approach a, a little bit is that I think you know you say we have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C and plan mm -hmm. A is obviously the the goal like Tracy said like shoot for the moon and and we talked about how you know obviously if, if if the approval is given to go forward with the determining whether that plan can work the majority of the time and effort will go towards that plan as it should if that is what we are determining is plan A, as it should, but in all likelihood at some point, there is a strong chance that we might have to pivot to a different plan, a blended plan or a fully remote plan. I work in a restaurant. I see three days a week how people do not have regard for the rules of social distancing and mask wearing in phase four. So Yeah, but that's not going to go down the hybrid. That's going to go, like, if you're saying it goes backwards, it would go backwards, like, all the way. Okay, so that's my point though, is that if we've spent so much time focusing our efforts on in person, which if that's what the, if that's the decision of the board of, as the majority, that's what they should spend most of their time focusing on. If we do that, we will not have spent as much time focusing, and in my view, not enough time focusing on a possible hybrid or a possible remote option. And if at least if we had the high, if the blended option was was the focus, we would have some we would have more experience and the students would have more experience and the staff would have more experience with that remote learning should we in all likelihood have to pivot to that at some point in time. I think that's part of the struggle with with kind of like saying we're going to shoot for the moon and if we don't get there we have other options but I think those options aren't aren't going to be fully flushed out and I think that's my concern about with that strategy I guess. So, so is it more it? about the wording for this week? Because in two weeks when we meet again when, is when... No, they want to focus on blended versus focusing yeah. on modified in person. Okay. So this first vote okay. will be, um, we have a motion and we have a second to modify um, action item B, to, uh, which was to make a recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff. And to modify that to that motion to be explore the feasibility of a, of a blended plan for all students and staff. Um, are we prepared to vote on that that motion? So you want it to be okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tracy. You want it to be. It can't be both. 
Uh, I, I agree with Member Hannes that we are going to have to. The administration can't evenly spread or shouldn't evenly spread their efforts on all three plans because but, but they we, are inherently going to anyway. It says working groups. <laughs> like, but so, the majority of the attention is going to go towards Plan A because that's Plan A, and it should go towards Plan A because that's the plan that you're most attempting to accomplish. If you're saying like this is our shoot for the moon, you're going to do everything you can to make that plan come to fruition within all reasonable expectations, and you should. So you're not going to be evenly just exploring all options. I do not believe, and I don't think you should in, in right. that instance. Maybe, Dr. Russell, you can tell us on how you plan on allocating time sure. over the next couple of weeks. Sure. So a couple of things. I, I want to reiterate to the board that we're not starting from scratch. We have had a remote learning task force. If you go into this guidance, it gives you really clear direction on if you cannot make an on-site work with social distancing, it gives you blueprints on, on, on where to go with a hybrid. It gives you possible scenarios. If you look at the appendix here, there's a lot of really um, good stuff that, that we could lean on. I, I don't want anybody to think that um, we're starting from scratch, nor, and, and I respect what, what everyone is up here saying, but I, I want to continue to reiterate that we're going to be working on three. We are going to be spending the appropriate amount of time on all of these. We already started that, that work. And, and so we have three separate groups going, assistant superintendents running each group. We're recruiting staff members tomorrow. Uh, we've got a lot of positive feedback from our staff. They want to be part of, uh, of these discussions. And I definitely think that while it is challenging, that's been the name of the game for these last six or seven months, we can sit down with groups of employees and flush out what all three of these would look like. I, I, I really feel like we can do that because we've already started uh, that work. Again, I, I, I think we're all very close to where we want to be. You heard our, our, our comments today. On-site instruction is always the preferred model and we want to do everything we can to make sure it can work, but we also need to at the same time recognize that if it can't, we have to have a robust um, blended approach and what I'm suggesting is we're going to be building both of those at the same time with always a goal of on-site instruction, but we may have to pivot depending on if we hit an insurmountable roadblock. That's how I understood it. Too. Then I think I'm kind of where Member Simanti started this conversation that it seems strange to ask your team to, ask us to approve to let your team go and make plans for all three scenarios. I, I'd much rather send the community a signal that here's what you can plan for, for your family's care needs and work needs and all the other things that come in to, to play for every dinner table conversation uh, and taking a vote on this today when really what we're asking you to do and what you just said I believe if I interpret it correctly is you're going to go explore all these plans with the appropriate members at the table and come back to us in two weeks to tell us here's what reopening will look like based on everything that we've considered. I think it's disingenuous for us to say modified on site today when at what you just said was you're going to allocate the appropriate amount of time to each of the scenarios and help me understand what I might be missing. No, I, I don't think anyone is wrong here. What, what, what I'm trying to say is I'm going to go back with the planning teams and in all of the administrators and the goal is always as the guidance reads and as we have heard everybody say today on site is the preferred method as long as it can work. Um, if it can't work, then I'm going to come to you in two weeks and say, we can't make this work, but here is the hybrid model that we built, and this is the next best thing, or the blended model that's the next best thing, and here's what this will look like. And that starts in the survey. So tomorrow, when we send out surveys, or Wednesday morning when we send out surveys, we are going to be asking people questions about on-site and blended in the event we have to pivot to that. So you know, we are going to be able to, to explore all of these things with our staff and, and to be able to come back. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to plan for all of these no matter what, because I'm going to go back to that continuum analogy I used. What I'm recommending at this point in stage four is that we enter here if it's feasible to do. If it's not, we'll, we'll, we'll pivot it back. But at any point, we can be anywhere on this continuum. And, and so we need to plan for all three of those. I do think we can dedicate the appropriate amount of time, again, this whole summer has been a tight turnaround with, with guidance and all of that other stuff. Uh, I think the signal 
in terms of, you know, w what I'm recommending is that um, on-site is always the preferred model. However, we're not going to shove that round peg into the square hole if it doesn't fit. We need to talk with our staff and then we need to come back in at the latest in, in, in two weeks. That's where we need to make sure that we communicate everything to our family so that they can plan uh, accordingly. But I think tonight, if I'm, a, if I'm a parent listening to this, I, I have a pretty good idea that the school district is seriously considering these two main options modified on site in a blended and while modified on site is preferred we're not going to jump into that right away i i don't want to make you know a, a vote for the board that that's what i'm coming in as the superintendent with my perspective on that that as a community member that sounds confusing uh if we're going to vote on an action item either in blended as i proposed or as modified on site that sends to it's Tracy's it point, if you're sitting in the audience, it that sends a signal. signal. Yeah, and yeah that, that sends a that's, signal. That's, that's why that. I think, uh, you know, personally, I want to have both votes so we do send a signal as to what our plan A is, knowing that we need to fall back on a plan B and plan C. And which I think to, I think you might be endorsing Member Hannes's point that we are asking the administration to put more of their eggs in the plan A basket because that's yes. where you should spend more of your that's time thinking through all the details. That is plan A. And the motion that we're currently under discussion on is what is plan a? i recommend that plan what a be plan blended a? instruction as opposed to modified on site for i won't repeat all the reasons that i've named yeah. yes. once again karat we agree 100 <laughs> percent. all right well so it, it sounds like we're ready to take a vote i'm gonna i'm gonna get like a billboard that says that <laughs> <laughs> so melissa we need to take a vote now to amend um action item b uh the recommendation for fall learning for modified on site five days per week to become explore the feasibility of a blended model for all students and staff so we're, the first vote that we are taking is if we want to adjust that motion to be explore the feasibility um, of a blended model for all students we're, and staff we're voting right now on whether we want to vote for that or we're voting we're, on we're voting that. on amending the motion. voting on just amending we're right? going to end up with one motion we're either this yes. will amend it and then we'll have to vote so all if right. we want to amend it so go ahead and uh, right. Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Nay. Member Olchik. Nay. Member Samanti. Nay. Member Weiner. Yes. Aye. Member Hughes. Nay. The motion failed to amend um, action item B to explore the feasibility of a blended model for all students and staff. So we're back to the motion, and we already have a motion on the table for the recommendation of fall learning for um, modified on-site instructions five days per week for all students and staff as presented. Is there any other additional discussion before we call roll? I'd like to suggest a new motion, or I'd like to motion for a different approach. Uh, if we're asking the administration to go start to plan and appropriately allocate the time to each of those plans, I do want to signal to the community that no decision has been made. And by to, in order to do that, I do think that we have to tell the community that the right people are at the table, that the right considerations are being considered, for lack of a better term, it's 11 o'clock. Um, and sure. that we should modify this motion to be give this the administration permission to go explore all options appropriately uh, we have another motion the, on the, the table first motion the yeah. first motion that you brought up we have another motion on the table to amend action item b from uh a recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction for five days a week for all students and staff to explore the feasibility of, on, of modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff. That's going to require a second. Sorry, what was the? How did you frame? It? How did you phrase the beginning part of it, though? What right now, it is it's from the slide. It is a motion to amend action item B, which is currently a recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff. To amend that to be. Um, a recommendation to explore the feasibility 
for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff. No, that's not the sorry, motion. Sorry, sorry. No. Sorry, sorry. What, do you, what is your motion? Yeah, I would say, um, I'm not as good at ling with language yeah. as you are, Darren. Um, uh, the motion that I'd like to suggest is that, let me pull it up, um, recommendation to pursue remote instruction, blended instruction, and modified on-site instruction. Equally. Not, uh, equal, equally. Equally. And come back to the Board of Education in with a couple of weeks with a plan. I don't know how to say that as well as you But what can. they're asking us for is a recommendation on where to focus. They're, they're, th that's what they're coming here asking for today is to, to know so that nobody's blindsided when they come forward with a plan. But you, okay. So you want a recommendation to explore. Is that what you said, explore? No, a recommendation for to appropriate school reopening considering for remote learning, blended instruction, and modified on-site. Well, for considering remote learning. Recommendation for considering remote learning, blended learning. And modified on-site on -site instruction. All right, let me try this again. We have a motion on the table to amend action item B, the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff to be amended to a recommendation to consider remote learning, blended learning, and modified on-site instruction for all students and staff. Okay. Is there a second for that? Second. Second. Any discussion? I just think this is more clearly aligned to what we're asking the administration to do and does not send the signal that we are marching towards a modified on site without the uh, input from without well not just the input because I think input has started to be collected. It's not that we're without it. It's just that there are a significant number of details that, given all the questions we have, oh, yeah. that need the appropriate time to be answered. I'd like to give them, that team the time to answer them. I would like to say that, that we have been called on as a board to give guidance on direction here. And um, the, the investment that they want to put into this modified on-site instruction is a lot. And one of the things that they're asking, the, the administration has stood up and kind of took an, taken a stance on their recommendation. And the question to the board has been, can you give us guidance on the preference that you have if we can actually make it work? Obviously, that's why we have to come back here in a couple of weeks. But where is, where is the guidance from the board? My problem with this motion to amend is that this is a lack of guidance from the board. Um, I think the last motion was on the right track in, in giving a different level of guidance that we preferred blended. That, that did not pass. This one is, is basically, in, in all sincerity, um, negating this recommendation at all because it is actually just putting them back in the same situation they had before we walked in the room today. Any other discussion? I call the question. Yeah. I said I call the question. Let's vote. Okay. Oh. I, I couldn't quite hear you. All right. Melissa Carroll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. I'm sorry, are we voting on the new motion? Is that what yeah, the motion to amend. To amend to the new. Mm -hmm. Aye. Member Harris. Nay. Member Olchik. Nay. Member Samanti. Nay. Member Weiner. Yes. Member Hughes. Nay. Motion failed to amend. Um, action item B um, from the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff to the recommendation for uh, considering remote learning, blended learning, and modified on-site instruction for all students. So we are back to the original motion, um, which has already been uh, motioned and seconded for the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff. Um, is there any further discussion? I'll just name, I, I can imagine the way this vote's going to go. I'll just name that 
ultimately when we t when we sign on to become board members, we sign on to make our voices known, but then also get on board with the decision and make it as strong as possible. Um, the request that Dr. Russell and his team is asking for here is to have the permission to go plan. What in the language of modified onsite, I think that honestly does require a significant amount of effort and planning. And that's where we would have allocated the time anyway to all of the t uh, three uh, folks that spoke today from each of the bargaining units. You all have the energy and the willpower to go and start to plan for that. And I encourage you to, to go, go forward with that. Um, ultimately, in two weeks, we're going to get a plan. And uh, at that time, as a board, we have to make the call. Does this plan pass the sniff test? Or was it the we tried to make a square peg fin do round hole, and it didn't bend? And if it doesn't bend, we should ask the administration to default to one of the other plans that they had also had to develop in the next couple of weeks, which again is no small task. And so um, uh, as a board, as a district, uh, in our, as a community, I highly recommend that all of us uh, get on board with what, whatever is decided here today to let the folks come to the table and plan and make some decisions around what could happen and what can work. Uh, you'll have my full support. I'm sure you'll have everybody's full support here is knowing this team. Uh, it's, uh, it's exactly what we need to do for our students. I concur with what you said. And I, I believe that despite that kind of detour that we just took, I believe that we're all still on the same page. And I trust and know that Dr. Russell and his cabinet have a fully are fully able to pivot and we all have to be nimble here like literally well, everybody all stakeholders are going to have to be nimble here because of the changing situations in our state in our country so i am fully in, i fully support dr russell trying to work with the groups and see what we can come out because i personally don't know how it will all look and i trust that all the teachers and principals and custodians and everyone's going to come to the table and they're going to come back in two weeks and we're going to have a plan and it'll be vetted and everyone will have a voice and we'll know where we, where we stand well said both of you mm -hmm. um you know it's so, so correct yeah. all right we're gonna we're gonna take a, a brief recess of about five minutes we we'll go ahead and call us back to order here uh, we did, sorry for the, the lost sound on the feed, so I, I don't know if uh, either Karat or Tracy want to, uh, if there's a part yeah. of your comment that you want to make sure uh, is heard by the people uh, watching on YouTube, please yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll keep this brief. Uh, I, I, can, I think we can see where the vote's going to go tonight, but really it's a vote to give the administration a chance to plan. I know our board, I know how... Uh, as a board member, you are to get behind the vote, and I encourage the entire, uh, all the working groups to get behind, let's make a plan. Let's make a plan for not only what does school reopening look like, but what does, what does maintaining school look like in this unpre unprecedented year? Uh, and so I encourage everybody, just as much as we as board members, get on, get on in support of moving the vote forward. Uh, and what, what that vote signals, uh, I, I think what we're signaling is today, for Dr. Russell and his team to start to allocate the appropriate amount of time to each of these plans to come back to us in two weeks with, here's what we can make work and we have the highest confidence in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karat. Yes, Tracy? I, I concur with what you're saying and we took a scenic route, but I, we're, we're landing in the same place. I, I, I know that we're, we're all on board and we want, we know that the working groups are all gonna work where the rubber hits the road on this plan with the ultimate goal of trying to get that and if it doesn't happen so so be it but it has to be vetted by the principals uh, teachers and custodians and support staff everyone needs to be part of it and then they'll come back so tell me when we meet in two weeks and I, I think I just want to wrap it up by saying that I've, I've always looked at, at this plan as a, as a continuum um, I, I don't imagine that this roller coaster ride may end anytime soon as much as I wanted to and as much as my kids beg me to have it end um, you know sometime soon uh, I, I think what was important tonight at least from my perspective was to not only say that all that, that whatever model we take moving forward um, 
lives on that spectrum and, and that we're taking our, our kids seriously. But I, I, I looked at this vote as an opportunity to, to, to back what our administration was asking and they said that this is the, the path that they would like to take forward as the primary <coughs> goal in moving forward. Um, we, we know that on paper sometimes things look great and then you go to actually implement them and they don't work great. But this is a, this is a time like I talked about, you know, leaders rise in moments like this and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the teams work together and come up with a creative way to make this work. And um, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, giving our kids the best possible education that we can. So. If there's no other comments. I, I just want to make one quick ahead. comment. I guess, uh, you know, since we went through that um, good conversation, I think it was really good. I, but I just want to say that this vote to me is, is a signal of full support to Dr. Russell's um, team to date and um, their plan to hash out the details with stakeholders in the next two weeks. So I fully support uh, Dr. Russell. Thank you. Ditto. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Nay. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the recommendation for fall learning for modified on-site instruction five days per week for all students and staff as presented. Next up on our list is the Knowledge Universe Education, the Champions Program contract renewal. Is there a motion to renew the agreement between District 58 and Knowledge Universe Education for a period of July 1, 2020 through June 30, 2021? So move. Second. All right, any discussion? Dr. Are Russell, do you mind flushing this out? So uh, like exactly what, we're, this is renewing a contract to have a working agreement with them, correct? What it looks like and all that is to be hashed out correct that is correct so you're not looking at anything new um, we could have a possibility given the unique set of circumstances that we need to go to champions and we need to ask them to do additional services for us to provide more for our families um, what this is is just basically saying and Todd please jump in if I'm incorrect <laughs> champions will remain our before and after school care provider we're gonna sign another contract this year and um, you know we would then move forward with, with the same implementation that we always had I uh, do want to let the board know that we will be um, looking at different options for champions for our parents um, especially uh, with early release and things like that uh, to provide them with with more care uh, but this is just basically committing to champions for being our vendor thank you very much for mm -hmm. that up. any other questions or discussion all right Melissa please call roll member Weiner aye Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to renew the agreement between District 58 and Knowledge Universe Education for the period of July 1, 2020 through June 30, 2021. Next up is a special education transportation contract extension. Is there a motion to approve the contract extension of 4.3%? for the special education transportation with sunrise for 2020 through 2021 as shown in the attached rate sheet. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. I motion carried to approve the contract extension of 4.3% for special education transportation with sunrise for 2020 through 2021 as shown in the attached rate spreadsheet or rate sheet. Uh, next up is a reimbursable lunch cost. Is there a motion to set the cost of reimbursable paid lunch to $3 for the 2020 through 2021 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to set the cost of reimbursable paid lunch to three dollars for the 2020 through 2021 school year. Next up is surplus equipment. Is there a motion to designate seven kilns, a Toro 724 snowblower, John Deere GX85 tractor, a Husky compressor, a Quincy compressor? and a delta table saw as surplus equipment. So moved. 
I need a second? Second. All right, any discussion? Yes. On the kiln? Thank you. Could we yeah. get a little bit of Could clarity so on what's I going believe on? That uh, is Mr. obviously a hot, hot topic. Yeah, Mr. Sissel um, would like to provide some clarity. Uh, Justin, are you still available? I certainly am. Perfect. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Welcome back, Thanks. Justin. <laughs> uh, so just to, just to kind of go over what a, a couple of the, the, the pieces here. First, the kilns remain at both middle schools. So, so using clay that would be fired will be a part of, the, of each student's art experience throughout their time in District 58 by, by placing it at the middle schools. Um, as we've looked at the, you know, one thing to notice in the motion is we are, we are designating seven kilns as surplus. There are 11 elementary schools. Uh, there are already were four schools in which kilns were no longer present or operable or being used. And so, you know, this is something that we've looked at over the course of, of really the past few years. Um, the, the art team has been working on developing consistency across the curriculum and and aligning that with the new Illinois art learning standards and while it is true that clay had been an experience in some of our classrooms and some of our elementary schools it was not a consistent experience for all of our students kilns regularly over time have been cited on inspection as either not being as not being properly vented and so there is there were buildings where there just weren't feasible or, or cost effective or appropriate ways to make that happen. And so over the course of the past couple of years, we, we have been talking about the eventual phase out of kilns. So there was a conversation with the entry uh, earlier year. I would, I would be um, remiss if I didn't say that certainly there was some conversation about, you know, we are, we are losing a project or two that we've been doing, but, but in, in most cases, it really is a project or two over, over the course of the year. And so when we look at all of the, the decision making, the costs to repair the kilns as they do fall into disrepair, the need to vent them, and, and the fact that this already was not a consistent experience across 58, we did make the decision to remove the kilns wholesale from the elementary buildings, knowing that there are, there are other opportunities for that experience, and also knowing that our our teachers are incredibly creative and, and will will find ways to continue to work in 3D. There are other types of clay, there are other types of media that can be used in those ways. So certainly there are some projects that may have been part of certain grade levels in certain schools for many years that will have to be reimagined, but um, that is the result of the decision. So it was cost prohibitive to, to, to fix them? Or if it got if, cited, it's a code, right? Say that, I'm sorry, say that last one more time? It was a code thing? So we were, we were in, a, in and I, I don't, in, in front of me right now, I have the specific buildings or specific years, but yes, there are, uh, there were a couple of the kilns that were uh, cited as not being properly vented. For example, the kiln in the Henry Puffer art room had a vent, but it literally blew back into the art room. So it, did, it didn't vent externally as we would, it would have to be, to be up to code. There were also a number of kilns that simply were sitting in boiler rooms that hadn't been used because, you know, over the past several years, the use of, of, of this type Type of project or not had been a somewhat autonomous decision by individual art teachers and so again as we're working toward consistency across putting all of that together along with yes the, the cost that we would incur to to maintain and at, at this point we would have had to purchase several parts several ventilation systems to be able to do this in all elementary or in all 11 of our schools okay thank you for explaining but he said they exist in the middle schools still correct Okay. There, there, is, there is a property control of both Harris and O'Neill, and every seventh grade student who comes through the art program, which is every seventh grade student virtually in the district, will have the experience of working with that medium in, at that time. Any other discussion around that item or anything else? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to designate seven kilns, a Toro 724 snowblower, John Deere GX85 tractor, Husky compressor, a Quincy compressor, and the Delta table saw as surplus equipment. All right. Up next is a 2020 through 2021 consolidated district plan. Is there a motion to approve the District 58 consolidated district plan for the 2020 through 2021 school year? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> Melissa, please call roll. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. 
Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the District 58 Consolidated District Plan for 2020 through 2021 school year. Last up, we have the purchase of 170 iPads and cases. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 170 iPads and cases for a total price of $55,921 or 900, I'm sorry, $55,921.50. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Motion carried to approve the purchase of 170 iPads and cases for a total cost of $55,921.50. We do have some announcements, um, some dates to take note of. I, I do want to note it's not listed on here yet, but later on this month we will be scheduling an additional board meeting to hear the results of the working groups and in, in getting this uh, fall plan together. We will make sure that that communication gets out as soon as that date is set, because that's going to be an important one that I think most of us, uh, most people will want to tune into. Um, but other ones that are already on the calendar, Friday, August 7th at 7 a.m. will be the Financial Advisory Committee. Uh, we don't have a location on that. Is that going to be at the ASC? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll be at the ASC. And on Monday, August the 10th at 7 p.m. will be a regular board meeting uh, right back here at Village Hall. The board will now go into closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the... Just minutes over to discuss the minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purpose of approval by the body of the minutes or a semi-annual review of the minutes as mandated by Section 2.065 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. So we will move into closed session here at 1145. Um, just for all our at-home viewers, we, the feed will stay up live. We shouldn't be more than a few minutes, and then we will be back. The board has now returned to open session at 1148 p.m. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the June 8th, 2020 closed session meeting and keep them permanently closed due to the confidential nature of their contents? So moved. Second. All right. All right. Um, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Mr. Uh, Member Harris is absent at this point, has left the meeting. Um, Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye, motion carried. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Um, is there any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Oh, he's not here. Uh, Member Olchik. Aye. Member Samanti. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned at 11.49 p.m. Just squeaked it out on today's day. <laughs>